Okay, the next item of business is the debate on tackling drug deaths and drug harm. I'd invite members who wish to participate to press the request to speak buttons uh, now or as soon as possible. Uh, and I call on Gillian Martin on behalf of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee for around six minutes. Ms Martin. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, as the convener of Health, Social Care and Sport Committee, I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this afternoon's debate. And I want to give my apologies because I may not be in the chamber for the closing speeches, as I have already let the President Officer know. Uh, when my committee took evidence from the Minister for Drugs Policy last year, it became apparent that a number of key policy levers in this area lie with the UK Government. And as part of our joint scrutiny work, we heard evidence that the 1971 Drug Misuse Act was outdated and fails to reflect the public health-led approach that we want to pursue in Scotland. Indeed, a root and branch review of the 1971 Act was a key recommendation from the Scottish Drugs Deaths Task Force. It is therefore extremely disappointing in the face of evidence and recommendations from experts in this field that the UK Government has no plans to review the 1971 Act. And given this mix of devolved and reserved powers, I was pleased that we were able to take evidence from the UK Minister for Crime and Policing, Kit Malthouse, and I hoped that he could give us confidence that those UK government levers could be used to work with us in Scotland in the aims of reducing drug harm, aims which everyone across this Parliament wants. However, the session, highlighted, the session with the Minister highlighted quite a fundamental difference in approach between the UK and Scottish governments. For example, the UK government is clearly anxious that creating safe consumption facilities, even on a trial basis, might be seen to condone drug use. But this misunderstands the underlying reasons that drive people to take drugs in the first place. Overwhelming evidence underlines a very strong link between poverty, deprivation and trauma and a heightened risk of drug addiction. The statistics bear this out. In 2020, people in the most deprived areas of Scotland were 18 times more likely to suffer a drug-related death than those in the least deprived. People will not stop taking drugs simply because they are illegal. For people in a desperate situation, a criminal justice-led approach will not help. It can, in fact, make things much worse. Indeed, a recent report from the House of Commons Health and Social Care Committee called for a shift from the current criminal justice approach to a health approach like we have in Scotland, and for responsibility of drugs policy to move from the Home Office to the Department of Health and Social Care. Very progressive. The provision of safe consumption facilities needs to be considered in that context, first and foremost as a health intervention. And there is strong evidence that, by providing facilities where people can take drugs in a safe and supervised environment, safe consumption rooms can reduce overdoses, drugs death, bloodborne virus infection rates and public injecting. During our joint committee, I was encouraged by the UK Minister's apparent willingness to consider new evidence around the successful trialling of safe consumption facilities in New York and the many lives this trial has already, already saved. But unfortunately, Mr Malthouse's more recent uh, comments to the media have been less than encouraging. However, I am hopeful that proposals brought forward by the Glasgow Social Care and Health Partnership will enable a safe drug consumption facility to be piloted in Glasgow within current legal constraints. Given the evidence to the Criminal Justice Committee in November last year, the Lord Advocate recognised that the scale of the, the crisis we currently face uh, and offered a potentially pragmatic way forward. She indicated that in the instance of a proposed safe consumption room uh, that was precise, detailed, specific and underpinned by evidence and supported by Policy Scotland, prosecutions might be deemed not to be in the public interest. And during the pandemic, the Lord Advocate de demonstrated a similarly pragmatic approach by issuing guidance that it would not be in the public interest to prosecute anyone registered with the Scottish Government Population Health Directorate supplying naloxone to be administered in an emergency to counteract a drugs overdose. I am hopeful that such pragmatism will help us navigate the legal constraints we face and to continue to pursue a public health-led approach to tackling drugs death and drug harm. It, clearly, the trialling of uh, safe consumption facilities is only one element of an effective public health-led approach. And I agree with Mr Malthouse when we, we took evidence from him that there is no silver bullet when it comes to tackling drugs death. But we as a committee do not do see this. We do see this as a public health issue rather than being justice-focused. I will. 
Michael Marra. I thank the uh, member for giving way. I wonder whether, in terms of any of the evidence that the committee saw in the representations they had from, uh, the, uh, from the, the, the Minister from the UK Government, whether there was any analysis or evidence as to why drug deaths in Scotland are almost four times higher than the rest of the UK. Gillian Martin, then give you the time back. Well, I'm not sure that, that would come from the UK Government. Certainly in the Health and Social Care uh, and Sport Committee, we've heard that a lot of the, the historic deprivation that is multi-generational has, has led to this situation. And of course, the member lives in Dundee. He will know that to be the case in Dundee. Things that happened decades ago, which took the, 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 the lifeblood out of communities, has led to deprivation and possibly has, is one of the, the, the reasons that we have this situation. Um, Connected, I want to talk about the, um, just very briefly about our recent inquiry into the health and well-being of children and young people. Um, and it's important that we address the particular impact on children and young people of problem drug use and alcohol use within families. And connected to this is the impact on stigma around drug use uh, by, by women. It's not, say, it's not, it, it, you cannot say that somebody is not a good mother because they have an issue with, with drug use. Um, so again, a criminal justice approach when it comes to women is actually going to be take out, putting more pressure on a family and their children. I have run out of time because I took that intervention, but I do uh, look forward to continuing work collaboratively with colleagues across other committees in this parliament and their shared goal of identifying a sustainable long-term path towards tackling drug deaths and drug harm in Scotland. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Ms Martin. And I call on Eleanor Whittam on behalf of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. Again, in six minutes, please, Ms Whittam. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank the Convener of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee for opening this important debate. That committee rightly highlights that drugs deaths and problems drugs use are a public health issue. Whilst there continues to be a debate over whether this is a public health issue or a criminal justice issue, we need to keep in mind it is also and primarily a social justice issue. Drugs deaths do not often occur in more wealthy populations. They are a distressing and wholly avoidable indicator of inequality, deprivation, poverty and trauma. The Scottish Association of Social Workers told us that poverty is still one of the leading contributing factors for substance use and so a wider focus on tackling poverty and inequality is essential. The impact of poverty, food insecurity, fuel poverty and digital exclusion on Scotland's families and communities is devastating and increases the risk of pushing individuals towards drugs use. Harmful drugs use is also most damaging to communities already struggling with disadvantage, poverty and marginalisation. These are complex structural problems, far from unique to Scotland. We need to redouble our efforts and tackle the underlying causes of poverty and inequality, a task that all of us in this place, across all committees, must commit to. Our joint work across the three committees is a great example of widening that focus, but it is not an easy task. If the social justice, uh, very briefly, yep. Michael Mara. I appreciate it, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the member giving way. He'll heard my intervention to Ms Martin, who highlighted deprivation in parts of England, uh, sorry, in Scotland, uh, but also that there are areas of England which have had the same deprivation in Scotland, in fact, areas that are deeper, but yet do not have the level of drug addiction and drug death that we have in Scotland. Has any of the evidence your committee taken explored those issues? Ms Whittam, and I can give you the time back for that. Thank you very much. Um, I thank the member for his intervention and um, except for repeating what my colleague has already said, I would um, point as well to the fact that we have a multifaceted issue with, with polydrug use in Scotland that is unique to Scotland and, and that maybe does explain um, some of our issues that we are facing. So our joint work across three committees is a great example of widening that focus, but it is not an easy task. If the Social Justice Committee does anything, it highlights the complexities of issues such as this. It highlights that every life um, of every individual in Scotland does not fit into one single remit. As a committee, we've heard that individuals can get trapped into a funneled web of complex issues that can become ever worse. Losing a job, taking on caring responsibilities or an increase in fuel costs. For someone with little income, just one such an event can start this downward, often lonely spiral. For someone with, who is experiencing multiple severe and complex disadvantage, the risk of problem substance abuse multiplies. We are hearing through our current committee inquiry on problem debt and low income that many families and individuals are in no position at this point in time to build any financial resilience. They can't absorb the shock of changes in circumstances, and this can impact hugely on their emotional resilience. 
And poverty is not only a feature of unemployment. Those in low-paid, precarious jobs also face significant financial challenges. Many struggle with their mental health because of debt, and some with existing mental health problems find it hard to engage with services and support to help them out of that debt. And as we've heard, stigma also magnifies these issues. And we know, without enough to live on now, and in the face of the cost of living crisis, people are at real risk. We know that some of the reasons someone turns to drugs are complex and dependent on many factors. For some, it's youthful experimentation, but for others, what might have started as recreational use will progress into escapism and self-medication, a means to seek a way out of a hopeless situation when other means seems not to exist. But there is some light on the horizon, however. We are hopeful that the trend seen over the, last, uh, the past year of a decrease in drugs-related deaths continues. Always mindful, however, that any such death is one too many. And I know of, of on a personal and work-related capacity just how devastating such a loss is and how far the ripples go. This tentative but positive decrease in deaths is a result of specific actions taken to provide holistic support. The Housing First approach recognises that social barriers people face, the impact of the lack of the, that most fundamental of needs, a safe place to call home, and the needs for services to gather around vulnerable people. Organisations such as the Simon Community, Favour UK, We Are With You and Turning Point Scotland tell us that it is not just about prevent, the prevention of death and further harm, but of working with people over a long period of time at their pace and providing the support that they need, recognising sometimes a traumatic past. Turning Point Scotland say that while well, the complexity of a need was identified as a priority for the task force, no specific recommendations were made and they are calling for greater, greater integration and strategic thinking so that the work across the system is coordinated. They have also highlighted that one positive step is that homelessness prevention looks set to become a duty across the public sector system, but emphasised coordination is required across public services to realise the good intentions of policy. What is, um, what is it that can prevent this holy grail of coordination of services around the needs of individuals or the no wrong door approach for all of those who need support? We have been made aware daily of the brilliant, innovative, compassionate projects that respond to need. We saw how quickly we could respond to need, particularly homelessness during the pandemic. We know that systems can change. The system that creates poverty needs to change. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, there are different layers to this problem. The immediate joined-up compassionate support that a person needs to prevent them falling further. The actions of public services to ensure that, they, that all they do um, together is to coordinate and agile and aligned um, with the third sector. The third sector are crucial in this. And finally, and perhaps the hardest but most crucial, is to achieve and that needs to have the will um, that's in all of our power to end the structural unfairness that makes people vulnerable in the first place. Thank you, uh, Ms Whitam. Before calling the next speaker, a gentle reminder to those wishing to participate uh, in the debate that they should press the request to speak buttons, and that includes those who have made an intervention. Um, I now uh, call on Audrey Nicholl on behalf of the Criminal Justice Committee again, six minutes. Uh, Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And it's uh, also my pleasure uh, to open this debate on behalf of the Criminal Justice Committee. Uh, last year, the Criminal Justice Committee heard from people with lived and living experience of problem drug use. And they told us that they wanted to see tangible outcomes from the work of the Scottish Drug Deaths Task Force. I'm very grateful to members of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee and the Social Justice and Social Security Committee and the Criminal Justice Committee for agreeing to collectively consider the implementation of the task force's recommendations. The written evidence we received highlighted a very wide range of innovative work undertaken in response to the recommendations, but it also identified gaps and barriers to implementation which need to be addressed. And today's, date will, will be wider, to, sorry, today's debate will be wider in scope, and this afternoon I want to focus on the role of the police service in reducing drugs deaths and tackling drug harm. Now, we know that in the course of their operational duties, police officers frequently engage with people impacted by problem drug use. And we know that adverse childhood experiences and trauma are risk factors for problematic drug use. And therefore, it is vital that initial police contact is trauma-informed and trauma-responsive. The committee welcomes that training is now being delivered to officers that will support them begin the process of signposting people to appropriate recovery and treatment services earlier 
and more effectively, often at a time of increased <coughs> vulnerability. Police Scotland, in partnership with Medics Against Violence, has piloted a Pathfinder service for people with problematic drug use in Inverness, referring individuals to support that connects them with organisations that can aid their recovery. And following evaluation, this service is to be expanded, which is a very welcome development. However, this approach, approach will only be effective if treatment and recovery services can meet demand. And in that regard, the task force recommended that the Scottish Government pursue increased weekend access to treatment and support. However, the evidence we received suggests that out-of-hours treatment and support, especially at weekends, remains a gap in delivering a whole systems model of care. Staying on the theme of collaborative working and amongst the many examples provided in the written evidence, the Committee welcomed Police Scotland's partnership work with the Scottish Drugs Forum, the Scottish Recovery Consortium, Scottish Families Affected by Drugs and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service to provide training to probationary officers on substance use and the barriers to support and treatment caused by associated stigma. And Police Scotland's work with Scottish universities, such as the Robert Gordon University, to allow a quick turnaround time in drug analysis. In looking at naloxone, uh, the task force recommended that the distribution of nalox naloxone be maximised. And Police Scotland's proactive approach to training officers to administer the naloxone nasal spray to those suspected of a drug's overdose has undoubtedly saved lives. However, police officers are rightly concerned about facing investigation and or prosecution where naloxone is administered in response to an overdose where the person subsequently dies. And this is a, an important issue that we consider needs to be addressed. Another area of current focus is the legality of the provision of safe drug consumption rooms. And the UK government is not considering a legislative framework to support their introduction and has not devolved powers to the Scottish Government for this purpose. Police Scotland's discussions with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service have indicated that there is, an, and I quote, there is the belief that a legal framework may exist to allow those who would operate a safe drugs consumption facility to do so within current legislative provisions. However, Police Scotland has stated that while this may provide a basis on which to operate a facility, it would not address the, current, the potential criminality of those with addiction issues attending to use safe consumption rooms whilst in possession of illegal drugs. And, and I very much hope that this is an issue that can be resolved uh, timeously. So, in conclusion, presiding officer, there are many more issues that I would like to cover. However, I do feel that it is really uh, encouraging, and I think this is endorsed by the committee, uh, to hear about the innovative and collaborative work uh, taking place to tackle the complex and multiple issues that contribute to drugs deaths and drugs harms. The latest data on suspected drugs deaths in 2021 shows a fall of 8% from the previous year, but as we already know, every death is a tragedy. And while this is good news, there is still much, much more to do. And I believe that by working together in this parliament, across government and across the public and third sectors, we can and we will make an important contribution in tackling drugs deaths and drugs harms. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Nicholl. I now call on Angela Constance on behalf of the Scottish Government for around eight minutes, uh, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Every drug death is a tragedy, leaving families, friends and loved ones looking for answers and support. And as I always do, I offer both my condolences and continuing commitment to everyone affected by the drugs deaths crisis and to work across government, parliament and beyond uh, to save and improve lives. 
I would like to begin by thanking the three parliamentary committees for coming together across their portfolios to help provide insight into what has been and what should be done to tackle drug deaths and harm. This mirrors the approach of the National Mission, which is a whole systems holistic approach to providing care and treatment, not judgment, and opportunities for recovery and hope for people who use drugs. I want also to extend my thanks uh, to the task force for the quality and breadth of its work and its commitment to publishing recommendations this summer. Its focus on evidence-based recommendations has helped shape the priorities for the national mission alongside the advice from other groups such as the Residential Rehabilitation Working Group. Our national mission represents a significant step forward in tackling drug harms because it seeks to link crucial evidence-based drug treatment and recovery and essential health and social care services with the wider personal, social and economic needs of people impacted by drugs, who often find themselves in need of support across a range of services. So while we are making better links within health services, especially with alcohol issues and mental health, the mission also links closely to improvements in community and criminal justice, homelessness and housing, education and many other factors. Making change and improvement across all of these together is what marks out the mission as a right-based approach and a public health approach too. We are now in the second year of the national mission to save and improve lives, making the best use of the additional £250 million over the lifetime of this parliament. And our focus now is on delivery and implementation on the ground. The medication-assisted treatment standards demonstrate this public health approach clearly, linking in clinical service standards like same-day treatment with standards on psychologically and trauma-informed care, as well as standards for advocacy support for housing and benefits. The MAT standards reinforce a right-based approach to treatment and emphasise the importance of empowering people to make informed decisions about the types of help that is available to them. We are now working in partnership with local areas to implement improve and sustain standards across the country to ensure that everyone has access to high quality treatment and recovery services. And I will return to Parliament next month in a few weeks' time to provide an update uh, on progress with that. Reinforcing this rights-based approach, we are increasing publicly funded placements in residential rehabilitation by 300% over the course of this Parliament. Uh, this work is backed by uh, £100 million funding. And we have made significant announcements on the establishment of a national family rehab service, two child and mother houses, as well as increasing capacity and in other uh, residential services. And yesterday, we published evidence on the benefits of rehab in terms of improving health and well-being. And we are helping local areas to develop a standardised approach to commissioning residential rehab services and improving the pathways into and from rehab services. And this includes uh, better links uh, from prisons too. The mission makes crucial links to the justice system with the emergency services now carrying naloxone. We have already seen lives being saved from overdoses. The task force helped shape what is now the world's most extensive distribution network of naloxone. Seeing colleagues in the justice system provide this life-saving intervention is really positive. And I want to add my thanks to Police Scotland for becoming the first force in the world to roll out the carriage of naloxone. Our justice system as a whole needs to be more treatment orientated and trauma informed and we are taking forward the task force recommendations on drug law reform where applicable to the Scottish Government. And as part of our public health approach, I again state my strong support for safer consumption rooms as the evidence is clear they save lives. And we are leaving no stone unturned to find a way for these facilities to operate within our existing legal framework. As part of our mission, we are linking with other parts of government to tackle problems associated with drug harm, such as poverty and homelessness. And we are taking a cross-government approach to tackling poverty, which includes funding to reduce child poverty through social security. People in our most deprived communities are 18 times more likely to die from drug use than those in the more affluent areas, and this is simply unacceptable. On homelessness, the Government published the Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan and with COSLA we are consulting on a new duty to prevent homelessness. 
President Officer, too often stigma stops people from accessing the help they need. That is why we are taking forward the Task Force Stigma Strategy. At the turn of the year, we ran a media campaign to challenge stigma and are working on a charter that will encourage organisations to consider best practices to create a stigma-free Scotland. And I have heard repeatedly how stigma and problem drug use can cause untold hardship and trauma to families and loved ones. And in December last year, I published a framework on how we will improve holistic support for families. And this has been supported by an additional £3.5 million for alcohol and drug partnerships and a fund of £3 million to support vital frontline and third sector services. And we will continue working with local areas to implement this framework across the country. The National Collaborative for People with Lived and Living Experience, chaired independently by Professor Alan Miller, will bring forward the, the vision for integrating human rights into national policy and local service design and delivery based on internationally recognised human rights to be included in a forthcoming human rights bill. And I have no doubts that the National Collaborative will hold us all to account, making sure that people affected by drug use can participate in the decisions that affect them and will ask tough questions and demand clear answers. And on that note, presiding officer, I thank the committees uh, once again for working together. This is a very welcome approach and in the spirit of the national mission, which is an all Scotland, all government public health approach to reducing drug deaths and improving lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I now call on Sue Webber for uh, around seven minutes, Ms Webber. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Under the SNP, drug-related deaths have spiralled out of control, and it is clear that the SNP's current strategies to help those struggling with addiction have failed. There were a record number of deaths in 2020, and the death rate is 3.5 time, times that of the rest of the UK. It is also higher than any other European country. The scandal is Scotland's national shame, and it goes without saying that every single death brought about by the misuse of drug is a tragedy not only for the victim, but for the families and friends. We cannot go on like this. Lives are being lost and families are being torn apart. Yes, I will, wherever it came from. Gillian Martin. It's really about the, the language. When you say, uh, I hear Conservatives saying shame all the time. Do you not think that's stigmatising language and that we need to get away from that kind of stigmatising language when we're talking about drugs? Yeah. Sue Webber. I personally think it's an absolute shame that people are continuing to die from drug-related deaths in this country. Absolute shame. The Scottish Conservatives believe that a different approach is needed to help those suffering from addictions. The SNP government must listen to frontline experts and back our Right to Recovery Bill, which would guarantee treatment for those most in need. The key principle which underlines our proposed Right to Recovery Bill is to ensure that everybody who seeks treatment for addiction to drugs and or alcohol can access the necessary treatment they require. Individuals must not be refused treatment for drug and alcohol addiction services. Angela Constance has said she would give our Right to Recovery Bill proper consideration to see if it will do what it has claimed. She has confirmed that she backs the principle that people suffering from addiction should have the right to treatment and that our bill will be given fair and sympathetic hearing. The shift in language from the Minister is welcome. The consultation period to, on our Right to Recovery Bill showed that over 77 per cent of respondents backed plans to guarantee treatment for those suffering with addiction. The Bill was drafted alongside frontline experts who are overwhelmingly positive about these plans. We all know that there is no one single measure, measure that can help tackle the scandal of Scotland's drug deaths. But a guarantee of being able to access treatment can signal a new approach in that fight. Anne-Marie Ward from the charity Favour UK, who helped draft the bill alongside the party, has also welcomed Angela Constance's change of direction towards the proposed legislation. Favour Scotland said it had been told privately by some SNP MSPs that they will support the legislation. We have services that are currently inflexible. Addiction and mental health is constantly changing and services need to adapt to this. Our services need to adapt to the individuals. The individuals should not be adapting to the services. There is rightly, as has been mentioned across the chamber, the issue of stigma. And many people are ashamed to admit to their issues and ashamed to seek help that they require. 
We believe that our Right to Recovery Bill will help with this issue and it will provide everyone with a statutory right to addiction and recovery treatment services. In September 2021, the Lord Advocate announced that Class A drug users could be let off with a recorded police warning. The SNP's effective decriminalisation of Class A drugs will mean that thousands will get away with drug use. In 2019-20, it is estimated it is estimated that 30,469 crimes of drug possession were recorded and 7,000 are estimated to be for possession of Class A drugs. Yes, I will. Minister. Um, with regards to Ms Weber's comments on recorded police warnings, I think it is appropriate that she recognises that that decision was taken by the Independent Lord Advocate, one of course which uh, the Government is, is supportive of. Would you recognise the international evidence which overwhelmingly states that we need to move towards a public health approach as opposed to a criminalising approach, which actually causes more harm than good at the end of the day. Sue Webber, and I can Thank give you, Minister, and I can give you the same back, Ms Webber. Um, and I mentioned in my statement and my speech that actually it was the Lord Advocate that announced that, so that was recognised. But I think where we are is that we get dismayed that it's a single public health approach, and there needs to be an element of justice involved in this. We believe that the possession of Class A drugs is a serious offence and should not be dealt with through warnings. Rather than making the police's job more difficult to combat the supply of drugs, our focus should be on proving access to rehabilitation and treatment. No, I'm carrying on at the moment, thank you. Disappointingly, the SNP government refused to sign up to a UK government scheme to help tackle drug dealing and organised crime. Project Adder is a UK-wide initiative with £150 million of investment in England and Wales, and it is designed to tackle addiction and the supply of illegal substances. Project Adder helps people with their addiction and assists them in accessing recovery, but it also takes a hardline stance in targeting the criminality associated with drug gangs. The UK policing minister called the SNP's decision not to sign up deeply distressing and alarming. Scotland's drug deaths are a national crisis, and yet the SNP refused to engage with schemes like this. Surely they should be trying anything, especially something like this, that has evidence of being effective. And we know that the Drugs Death Task Force recommended safe consumption rooms, and the SNP government say they are moving forward with plans to establish a safer drug consumption room. But Chief Constable Ian Livingstone said that stronger evidence was needed before he could support drug consumption rooms. The Scottish Conservatives will not oppose the use of drug consumption rooms, but we do have serious reservations about their operation. As Chief Constable Ian Livingstone said, we need to proceed with caution. So while we won't oppose a pilot, if that is the route the Scottish Government is going to take, we need to see more evidence on their use. Drug consumption rooms are no silver bullet, and they won't solve all our problems. But unlike the SNP government, we will consider all options to tackle this crisis. I'm looking for leadership and pragmatism from the SNP government, and I would hope that our approach is reciprocated and that they take this approach too, both with accepting Project Adder and our bill, our game-changing right to recovery bill, developed with the help of those with lived experience, was lodged by Douglas Ross yesterday. It will save lives. It will provide a statutory right to addiction and recovery treatment services, including, but not exclusively, residential rehabilitation. And now that our bill has successfully passed through the consultation stage, it is time for the SNP government to throw their weight behind it so that we can tackle this national scandal once and all for all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Webber. I now call on Claire Baker for around six minutes, Ms Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. I do welcome this afternoon's debate and the work of the three committees. Uh, we can all agree that Scotland's drug death figures are unacceptable and shocking. We all know that more people die in Scotland than they do um, across the rest of Europe. A high rate of drug deaths destroys families and communities and too often continues a cycle of drug dependency and addiction. But while our rate of fatality, fatalities is high, we are not alone in having to face this challenge. There is evidence of other countries and cities who have changed their approach, focused on harm reduction measures, invested into services, not only addiction services, but also mental health and family support. They have changed their criminal justice response, they have tackled isolation and stigma, and they have turned around the despair and the misery that comes from addiction and drug dependency. 
So with leadership, focus, determination across government and across our public services, we can change our direction in Scotland. Scotland's drug deaths are not our fate. We have the resources and the capacity to save lives. So I welcome the approach of the Health, the Justice and the Social Security Committees and opening words from the conveners today. Scrutiny on policies and uh, progress is crucially important. And with two members' bills in the area of drugs policies coming to Parliament, the committees will be responsible for considering members' proposals on overdose prevention centres and patients' rights if they get members' support, as well as the work of government. And Labour will give all proposals a fair hearing. When I started as Labour's drug sports person a year ago, I recognised the failings of the Scottish Government and their culpability for the spiralling levels of fatalities. But I also give a commitment to be constructive and supportive where we see progress. I recognise the rollout of naloxone, the investment that is going into the third sector and the expansion of the recorded police warning scheme. Plans to increase capacity in residential rehabilitation facilities are a positive step, but more investment is required to make a more significant impact. And I welcomed the introduction of the MAT standards, which, if effectively implemented, would be transformational. But I said in response to the statement last week that it gives me no satisfaction to say that the commitment to embed and implement the MAT standards in a year is heading for abject failure. The government are now changing the goalposts. They are talking of embedding being different from delivering, and they are saying that delivery is not a tick box exercise. None of these caveats were given a year ago when the First Minister said they would be rapidly implemented. When the Minister announced the, state, the standards would be in place by the end of April 22, I spoke of the challenge in achieving this and the importance of accountability, calling for robust monitoring of implementation and interim reporting on progress. So I await the report in June, which will set out the progress. And while I am critical of the failure to react with the speed that is required of an emergency, I will scrutinise progress and press the government to make haste. There are challenges in delivering the MAT standards, but if they fall short, lives will continue to be lost, people will continue to suffer, individuals will disengage with treatment services, jeopardising their health and their wellbeing. The high level of non-fatal overdoses will continue and the risk of people catching serious infectious diseases will remain. The opportunity to rebuild lives will be more limited. The Scottish Drugs Forum survey from October last year included views of users. One man said, I am hearing of guys going to the clinic and being told to come back in two or three weeks' time. By that time, you are dead. Two weeks is a long time to an addict. It's more like two years. So others this afternoon will talk about the importance of treatment programmes and rehabilitation beds. And of course, a range of treatments must be on offer and everyone should have access to treatment that meets their needs. But the full implementation of the MAT standards are crucial for reducing preventable deaths. We are beyond admiring the problem. We need to see action. But there are fundamental issues that need to be addressed. Speaking to people in the third sector and in the NHS, more needs to be done to ensure there is investment in addiction psychological, psychology services and that that service is valued. There needs to be a greater consistency across the country on availability of treatment. The role of primary care needs to be enhanced. Progress is moving too slow. Two and a half years ago, the Scottish Government declared the drugs death crisis as a public health emergency, yet we have not seen the emergency response that is required. There are alarm bells ringing, the rise in fatalities among women, the level of fatalities among young people. Action needs to be urgently taken. Government ministers have still to develop a drug and alcohol plan that is clear, transparent and measurable to tackle the crisis, according to Audit Scotland. Very few people are still receiving heroin-assisted treatment. Drug checking facilities are not up and running, while they are in place now in Somerset. The Mental Welfare Commission recently found a serious lack of drug addiction and mental health support for prisoners, a decade after they raised similar concerns. Overdose prevention centres have yet to be established. We do not even have a finalised proposal, although as others have said, the Lord Advocate has indicated an openness to finding a solution. And drug use among young people is different, and yet there are still few bespoke services for young people, and a full response to the rise of street benzos is still not realised. And we need to recognise that the call for culture change is at a time when the recent workforce survey of frontline staff in the drug and alcohol sector showed that many are under-resourced, undervalued and under pressure. Demand on services is exceeding availability, with unsustainable workloads leading to mental and physical health issues for frontline workers. The workforce is under pressure and under-resourced, which will in turn impact on the implementation of the MAT standards and the delivery of treatment. So it is welcome that the committees have taken an interest and we have heard today about the evidence they took. 
I would encourage the committees to play their full part in ensuring we see delivery on the national mission to tackle the appalling level of preventable drug deaths in Scotland. Parliament must not take its eye off the ball. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms Baker. I now call on Beatrice Wishart, who joins us remotely for around five minutes. Ms Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I too would like to thank all three committees and the clerks for the work they are putting in as this joint committee to examine this vitally important and complex issue. Before I go further, I think it's important that we all pause and reflect on the impact that the drugs death crisis has had on people in Scotland. As has already been highlighted in the Chamber, there were just over 1,300 drugs deaths in 2020. And for the seventh year in a row, Scotland has had the highest rates in Europe. I'd like to express my condolences to all those who have been affected by a drug's death. And while I know that debates like these won't ease the pain of loss, I hope it provides some reassurance that we are taking this seriously. Scottish Liberal Democrats have long called for all issues surrounding drugs to be viewed through the lens of a public health problem rather than criminal justice. We believe that those who are caught in possession of drugs for, for personal use could be directed down a path of treatment or education rather than face a fine or prison time. By taking a public health approach, we can ensure that people get fast access to support and wraparound services, which can help both those at risk of drug-related death as well as their families. This can be done through, for example, safe drugs consumption rooms. My party has consistently called for such facilities, and I note that Paul Sweeney's recently proposed members' bill seeks to allow these to be created. While I and my party look forward to working constructively with Mr Sweeney on this issue, it's disappointing that it's taken an opposition MSP for these proposals to finally be up for discussion. However, this seems to be the norm when it comes to both of Scotland's governments and their approach in tackling the drugs death crisis. In 2015 and 2016, the SNP cut funding for drug and alcohol partnerships by 22%. That meant that vital services were hit causing relationships between service providers and users to collapse. Given how crucial these services are in helping people get the treatment they need, there's no doubt that the impact of this decision was devastating. But it's not just this government that needs to do more. The UK government's actions on this are also equally lacking. As the House of Commons Health and Social Care Committee stated in the 2019 inquiry, there needs to be a shift at UK government level to a health rather than justice approach. This view was also shared by the Scottish Drugs Death Task Force in their recommendation that there should be a root and branch review of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. While Mr Malthouse may, as he did when he gave evidence to the committee, point to the ADDER projects in England and Wales as a sign that they do understand the need for a public health approach, there seems to continue to be very much a belief that this is a criminal justice issue. Presiding officer, I fear that if the UK government continues to take this approach, then we may never tackle this crisis. And while Douglas Ross' proposed bill around the right to recovery could highlight a shift in conservative thinking, Scottish Liberal Democrats are still concerned that it may not do enough. However, as I mentioned earlier, we will always work constructively on a cross-party basis, take long overdue me measures to tackle the drugs death crisis. Considering both of Scotland's government track records with this issue, my party and I believe it's time for an independent body to be brought in, such as the World Health Organization. This issue will not be resolved overnight. Positive steps such as the rollout of naloxone to police Scotland are welcome, but there is still much to be done. If we are to tackle this, we must change our approach. Providing people with the support they need through safe drug consumption rooms and stabilisation services, rather than handing them fines or looking to imprison them, will, as I've said repeatedly, save lives. We do not have time to waste. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Wishart. We now move to the open debate, and I call firstly Karen Adam to be followed by Russell Finlay for around uh, six minutes. Ms. Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to first recognise everyone who has unduly suffered mentally or physically and those who have tragically died because of substance misuse or unsafe drug consumption. Every death attributed to unsafe drug consumption at the moment is an absolute tragedy for families losing their loved ones. The current level of harm being experienced by people who consume drugs calls on radical change in how we tackle this going forward. 
I say that as someone who has experienced my own friends and loved ones appearing in Scotland's drug death figures. For decades, successive UK governments have made a concerted effort to continue their so-called war on drugs, with grave hum human cost and huge expense to the legal system, the everyday taxpayer and our society. Of course, in dealing with um, see how I get through, maybe at the end. Of course, in dealing with substantive policy, we must take a cautious yet research-based approach. We also owe it to you all, the people living in Scotland, to explore all options at our disposal to reduce harm in our society. That is why we must not shy away from creating a national conversation on how to exactly do that, because change is needed as a matter of urgency. The UK Government needs to give serious consideration to radical reform of drug laws. After their decades-long failed war on drugs, to rule this out without due consideration would be a serious disservice, driven only by ideology rather than proper research and evidence. There are plenty of international examples out there that evidence that decriminalisation or legalisation and regulation is successful in reducing drug deaths and harm. There is more than one incentive to be explored for that potential. For example, organised crime groups would no longer thrive off of the proceeds from the illicit drug industry, proceeds of which is often used to fund other criminal operations, such as human trafficking. Maybe at the end, I'll see how we get on. Thank you. Drug reform must be about taking a realistic and common sense approach. We in Scotland are trying to forge a different path from the one being forged by the government south of the border. Like other countries with common sense drug policies, Scotland has taken a public health approach to tackling this issue. Under the guidance of Angela Constance and within the limitations of devolution, this SNP Scottish Government has taken its responsibility on reform seriously by setting out a national mission to improve lives and save lives, committed an additional £250 million over the next five years to increase access to services for people affected by drug addiction and exploring the need for safe consumption rooms for people who use drugs. It is not just a pity that we do not have the same level of commitment for Scotland from the Government in Westminster. It is an absolute disgrace. It has long been observed by clinicians that social determinants of health tip the scales against people who are addicted to substances. And the already daunting quest to recover from any type of addiction, and to be clear when I talk about social determinants of health, the World Health Organization defined this as the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age. These circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power and resources at global, national and local levels. We already know that the cost of living crisis will do untold harm to just about all of us who have less than they do. But make no mistake, this will also have a wide and long-lasting impact when it comes to health outcomes and substance misuse issues. To tackle this issue, Scotland needs the full and comprehensive powers over drug reform in our Parliament. Perhaps a quicker fix to this is Scotland gaining its independence. Q groans. Mitigating the worst of bad UK government policies should be a thing of the past, and their current policy on drugs inadequate. Stigma and criminalisation suppress the potential for future rehabilitation, harming an individual's employment prospects, and often leads to the continuation of generational, generational cycles of poverty and adverse childhood experiences. Penalties related to drug consumption should not be more damaging to an individual than the consumption of the drug itself. The picture of drug harm in Scotland is different than that one of south of the border. That is why it is so important that we in Scotland have full powers over our own destiny, to ensure our government, our laws, our customs and our values are reflective of the people who choose to live here. The UK Government continuing to cling to powers that should be in the remit of the Scottish Parliament just isn't ineffective. I'm, I'm speaking fast, so I've got time to take his in. Their policy isn't ineffective, but it is actually damaging. However, Scotland is a progressive nation brimming with innovation and confidence in our role in the world. 
on matters devolved, we are at the forefront of tackling some of the biggest issues in the 21st century. As we look to the future, fantastic work is already underway to make positive change. Perhaps someday soon, with the full powers in our own destiny, Scotland can join other progressive nations that have been able to radically decrease the rate of harm caused by unsafe consumption of illicit substances. Change is needed. And I've got 30 seconds. Take an intervention. Jimmy Green. I, I'm, I'm you know, quite depressed at the tone of that uh, contribution. I hope the member will reflect on the language being used in a very sensitive subject. The idea that Scotland has a drug death rate three and a half times the rest of the UK, including areas that suffer from far more deprivation, deprivation in many parts of Scotland, no member of the government benches has been willing to admit that, to accept it, to acknowledge it, or even to explain it, which is surely what they should be doing. Karen Adam, and I can give you the time. What back. I would say to the member is, I don't know why he's asking me to reflect on my tone. Um, at the, I think that was uncalled for. But in terms of reflecting on the bespoke issues to Scotland, that is exactly why we need powers here. Obviously, a UK-wide approach is not working for Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Adam. I now I can advise the Chamber there is a little time in hand, so um, any member taking intervention should get most of the time back. I call Russell Finlay to be followed by Emma Harper for around six minutes, Mr Finlay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, last year, Nicola Sturgeon announced the launch of what she called, and I quote, a national mission to end what is currently a national disgrace. She was talking about Scotland's drug death toll, which has risen every single year under this SNP government and which has doubled during her time as First Minister. Douglas Ross later challenged the First Minister over why she allowed a drug rehab facility in her Glasgow constituency to close in a line that caused incredulity at the time she admitted taking her eye off the ball. Nicola of Sturgeon, of course, did not take her eye off the ball. She knowingly cut addiction services as drugs deaths continued to climb. Okay. Deputy Presiding Officer, Scotland is the drugs death capital of Europe. Drugs cause abject misery and despair. It is encouraging that this national disgrace is being treated primarily as a public health issue. I agree that we cannot arrest our way out of the problem, and I cannot think of anyone who puts this forward as a credible solution. However, it would be equally misguided, naive even, to think that public health in isolation is the cure. Like Sue Webber, I too would like to talk about Project ADDER, which stands for Addiction, Diversion, Disruption, Enforcement and, crucially, Recovery. Described as a whole system approach, it puts a ring of steel around drug-ravaged communities, aggressively targets violent and parasitical gangs, while giving addicts the help and support they so desperately need. Yes, I will. Gillian Martin. Interested in that again, the language is used. Can you explain what he means by a ring of steel? Russell Finlay. Thank you. Yes, what is meant by a ring of steel is a robust policing approach in these communities, protecting the flow of drugs coming in to communities, to the benefit of the people who live there. Presiding officer, given the Scottish drug deaths are 3.5 times higher than the rest of the UK, inexplicably, it was obvious the UK policing minister, Kit Malthouse, wanted to deploy ADDER here. He identified Dundee as an ideal place, but to his bafflement, the SNP decided to keep the ADDER approach behind Hadrian's Wall. The minister is on the record expressing his disappointment Many suspect the SNP blocked Adder due to their strategy of taking a different approach to England just for the sake of being different. This episode raises concerns. Yes, I will. Minister. Uh, Mr Finlay may not be aware that the Scottish Government uh, participates in a learning network to uh, monitor Project Adder. There are aspects of Project Adder in terms of diversion and support for recovery that do indeed um, uh, mimic or mirror the national mission. But I wonder if he's also aware that um, his, uh, the UK minister really just wanted to rebadge work that we were already doing in Scotland as Project Adder, that there was no serious offer behind this. Russell Finlay, I can give you the time back. 
Thank you so much. Yes, I was aware of that, and um, it's the first suggestion I've heard from the Minister that this was merely a branding exercise, which I think will come as some news to the UK Policing Minister also. Now, this episode raises concerns that despite the Scottish Government rhetoric, they are not sometimes treating this as a national mission. Let's take another example of drugs in prisons. It is scandalous that so many prisoners go in clean and come out addicted. Far too few get the meaningful help they need to beat drugs and break the cycle of reoffending. When prison officers told me that drugs have never been so widespread and that most arrived soaked in mail, I raised it repeatedly with this government. But for months, nothing happened. In that time, prisoners died and overdosed. Yet officers' pleas for help were ignored. The Minister for Drug Policy responded to my calls to ban drug-soaked mail with a bizarre and patronising dismissal. It was only following a mass overdose at maximum security prison that the mail was finally stopped. This resulted in a dramatic and immediate reduction in drug incidents and ambulance call-outs. Deputy Presiding Officer, given Nicola Sturgeon's supposed national mission, why did her government not listen to prison officers far sooner? And where? Then there's the use of firefighters carrying naloxone, which is used to treat opioid overdoses. The First Minister and the Drugs Minister turned up at Bathgate Fire Station three months ago for a PR event to announce this. The only problem being that her government has not even reached an agreement with firefighters who have many concerns. I spoke with an FBU official today who does not know of a single firefighter who has volunteered to do so. If it really is a national mission, they need to put persuasion and partnership before PR. A respected campaigner who has already been mentioned today is Anne-Marie Ward from Favour UK, which stands for Faces and Voices of Recovery. Ms Ward agrees that ADA would certainly benefit Scotland. The charity is led by people who are either living with or have lived through the damage of addiction. They know what they are talking about. Ms Ward has also helped to draft my party's Right to Recovery Bill, which was lodged this week by Douglas Ross. It is simple and compelling legislation. It would enshrine in law the right of people with addictions to get the treatment they need. Glasgow has an estimated 18,000 problem drug users, maybe more, yet it is fewer than 20 rehab beds. Again, no one suggests right to recovery alone is the answer to everything, but its merits are clear, and I look forward to hearing more from my colleague, Dr Sandesh Galhani. The bill has secured strong public support, and I was very pleased with the response of the minister, who said that it would be given a fair and sympathetic hearing. For the sake of thousands of families suffering, suffering from the devastation caused by drugs, let us hope this Government will work with the Scottish Conservatives and other parties on this. It is time for a real national mission to put an end to this national disgrace. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I now call on Emma Harper to be followed by Michael Mara for around six minutes. Ms. Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I have a long-standing interest in drug policy and, and the work to reduce the number of drug-related deaths across Scotland, not only as a registered nurse, but as a member of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee in this session and in the previous session of Parliament. I also participated in the Scottish Affairs Committee Joint Inquiry into Drugs Death in Scotland at Westminster, led by Pete Wishart. I would like to make three points in my short contribution. Addressing evidence-based action that the Scottish Government has taken using the powers we have available to reduce drug-related harm and the importance of continued action to tackle drug-related stigma, as others have mentioned, and the response from the UK Government to this tri-committee inquiry. Poseidon officer, firstly, since the national mission to reduce drugs deaths was announced in 2020, the Scottish Government has taken action to transform our approach to drug policy within the constraints of the outdated 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act. We have changed our approach away from one which focuses on criminalisation to one which puts the health and medical needs of those impacted by drugs first. In health, this has included the rollout of the carriage of naloxone to save lives, and that is the people who are experiencing a heroin overdose, developing better outreach services, increasing the provision of rehabilitation beds, and the development of non-fatal overdose pathways and MAT standards. 
And regarding naloxone, the unintended overdose occurs in Scotland, and that's uh, it, when benzodiazepines are taken, whether it's illicit or prescribed, and then mixed with other substances, including alcohol. And it's worth highlighting that these are causes of deaths, uh, especially in rural areas. Um, naloxone only works for the reversal of opioids, and from my experience as a nurse, I know there is a reversal agent for benzodiazepine called flumazenil. I know there are side effects of the use of flumazenil, but I was wondering if the Minister could tell us potentially whether any work is being done to pursue this naloxone-type reversal drug to apply to benzos, especially in rural parts of Scotland. And in education, presiding officer, the government is bolstering teaching on drug and alcohol harms, ensuring children are educated at an early age on drug safety and on the harms that addiction causes. And by taking these and other measures forward, the Scottish Government is creating a new whole systems approach to implementing an integrated person centres medical and not punitive approach to tackling drug harm. And I also welcome the work of Project MATCH, which is a person-centred, client-centred approach to recovery, with harm reduction that also might be part of recovery. And it includes recovery, we must remember, includes relapse as well as support. Presiding officer, I do want to turn specifically to stigma. And by addressing stigma and the silence and alienation it causes, we make it easier for people to seek help. Stigma is damaging not only to the individual in terms of their mental health and sense of self-worth, but it also discourages people from coming forward to seek the help they need. Our media has an important role in addressing stigma. For example, in my South Scotland region, when I put out a press release welcoming drug funding and the progressive approach being taken in Scotland, with a stigma focus as well, a local paper used a stereotypical picture of a metal spoon with powder on it next to a used syringe. The paper has agreed to consider changing what images they use in the future, so I would welcome other print media addressing ad addiction sensitively to help start, tackle and it pot possibly eradicate stigma. It is welcome that the Drugs Death Task Force has developed a strategy which identifies actions to help reduce stigma. However, I often hear from constituents and others that there still exists an issue with stigma amongst a minority of health, social care and allied health professional staff. In a debate in January, the Minister agreed to my ask to explore the possibility of an e-learning module to be created, for example, on the TURAS, which is the NHS learning system for our healthcare professionals, including pharmacists, etc., specifically on drug stigma. So I'd ask the Minister, when closing, for an update on whether this e-learning module to tackle stigma is progressing. Presiding officer, there is strong evidence from other countries that safer drug consumption facilities help to prevent fatal overdoses and encourage people who use drugs to access longer-term help. The European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drug Addiction and the Advisory Council on Misuse of Drugs both support the use of DCRs and have said the effectiveness of drug consumption facilities to reach and stay in contact with highly marginalised target populations has been widely documented. In recent years, yes, I will take an intervention. Russell Finlay. Thank you very much. I just wonder if the member could perhaps uh, cast some light on when our government is bringing forward detailed plans of what DCRs will look like and where they will be. Emma Harper. Um, I, thanks for that intervention. I'm not in the government, so I can't speak for the government at this point in time, but I look forward to any plans that the government will announce, because I think drug control or drug rooms that help support people to prevent overtoes uh, should be taken forward in Scotland. We know... Um, of course I will, if I have time, President Officer. I can give you some of the time back. Um, Bob Doris. I, I apologise for, for making use of your time, Emma Harper, but thank you for taking the intervention. Are you aware that as recently as 2016, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde have got some very detailed plans for what drug consumption will look, look like? So we're not starting from scratch. There's a health-based approach with plans already put in place. Emma Harper. Thank you, Bob Doris, for that uh, update on what's happening in Greater Glasgow. My focus is in South Scotland, so quite often I don't know what's happening in other health boards directly, and we haven't got to that in health committee yet. So thank you for that information. Um, in recent years, the, both the UK Parliament, Scottish Affairs Committee and the Health and Social Care Committee have recommended introducing these facilities, but they're continually blocked by the, the UK government who refuse to accept evidence and refuse to devolve control over drug policy to this parliament. 
The UK government's whole approach, my final point, presiding officer, to drug addiction, addiction can be summed up well by Minister Kit Malthouse, who at the tri committee um, appearance, he said that people take drugs are sad and not bad. He said sad and not bad, presiding officer. That is, you know, drug use is so much more complicated than this. And what he said, I believe, belittled and condescended the people that are struggling from harmful use of drugs and alcohol. I'm sure he didn't mean to dehumanise and focus on criminality, but we need the proper powers to take our own Scottish approach forward to tackling drug harm, which is focused on evidence-based practice, presiding officer. So I repeat my calls on the UK Government to devolve drug policy to this Parliament. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms Harper. I now call on Michael Mara to be followed by Colette Stevenson for up to six minutes, please. Uh, th thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate, having followed the discussions of the committees uh, on the issue. I would, I would, a short reflection on the debate. I do think, and the Minister will be, I think, quite aware of this, that the tone of this debate, I think, is in a marked contrast to ones that we have had previously. And I, we on these benches would be very concerned about a breakdown in consensus around the scale of the challenge that we face and the need for a humble approach from the government and concerted and reasonable support from the opposition benches. A vacuum has been created in this debate from the lack of a strategic plan put forward by the government. We now have proposals from both sides of the chamber for action in this area. And if we do not have a strategic approach from the government, then more rancour will result in this and it is not going to serve the people of this country well. So, uh, these discussions were certainly uh, uh, helpful in, uh, in committee on a very narrow range of issues, but they gave no real strategic insight into the why of Scotland is, is the drug death capital of the world and our level of drug deaths that remain almost four times, uh, not at this moment, if I can just make some progress uh, maybe later on. And the, the drug death capital of the world and our level of drug deaths remain almost four times that of the rest of the UK under the same drug laws. I remain deeply concerned that the government does not have an evidence-based understanding as to why the situation is quite so horrific. And that is, in essence, the point I was making to colleagues who uh, I was grateful for allowing me in on uh, the, uh, the SNP benches. And they cited issues of poverty, Gillian Martin, and the issues of poverty. But we know that there are areas of England which have higher levels of poverty and no, nowhere near the levels of drug deaths that we have in Scotland. And on the issue of polydrug use in one, in one moment, um, ex the, uh, cited by Elena Whittam, Drug use exists across the UK, certainly not on benzodiazepines at the same level, but there is a clear issue of poly drug use across the whole of the UK. If I can say, and then I'll bring the Minister in, on the 13th of January, the Minister provided the Chamber with her personal analysis in less than one minute of why the situation in Scotland is so much worse, and she cited a higher level of drug use, benzodiazepine use, and not enough people in recovery. But without any authoritative accompanying evidence base, all of this is well-qualified speculation. I do not necessarily disagree with the Minister that these are themselves very serious issues. But set out alone in one minute, they are pretty much next to useless. Take the benzodiazepine issue. My contention is the withdrawal of Valium scripts and the creation of a Wild West street market for tablets of varying content and potency is the most lethal policy error of the devolution era. And the Minister stated in that uh, same debate, my opinion as to why we have seen that increase differs from Mr Mara's, yet no alternative analysis has been provided. If the Minister wants to make an intervention now, I would appreciate an answer to that point. Minister? point I have made to you in the past that as a politician I am not a clinician and I neither uh, prescribe or, or otherwise in terms of um, me medications. But it is factual to say that in Scotland that we have doubled the prevalence rate in terms of the use of drugs um, uh, in comparison to south of the border. Um, I think we agree on the significance on the implications of benzodiazepines but also uh, and, and heroin. And I hope that we both agree that it is a fact, uh, not my opinion, that we do not have enough people in treatment. And that is why all of our national mission at its very core is about getting more people into treatment that is right for them. I, Michael Mara. I, I appreciate the Minister reiterating what she said in the previous debate, which was exactly what she did say. But it is not clearly a coherent analysis that actually covers the scale of this issue. There is no evidence, that if, the minister, if the Minister can, can let me, there is no evidence presented against those numbers that she has brought to the Chamber in any form of marshalled way that gives an analysis of the where, the why, the how and the when. And I think that that would be appreciated by all members if we had an actual a full understanding. If we had a shared understanding around these benches as to the why, no thank you, as to the why this is happening, then we could actually say whether the measures that were being brought by other members in the chamber were the appropriate reactions to that situation. It, frankly, it's not good enough. 
On the associated issue of clinical care, we still await the benzodiazepine harm reduction guidance. The Minister talks about not being a clinician, but the draft guidance was published in August 2021, and no follow-up guidance has actually been published. I have lodged parliamentary questions to this effect today, and it would be good to know when this was arriving. So all of this remains a mission without a plan that is visible to the Parliament and, crucially, to the public. And we should be deeply worried for everyone, uh, that is, everyone that is concerned on this issue. We can be hopeful the Drugs Death Task Force, Task Force report provides an analysis, um, but uh, we will wait and see when that uh, is forthcoming. I want to mention in my uh, closing time about the Dundee Drugs Commission, who published their two-year review on the 2nd of March. Three months on, there has been no response from the partner agencies involved, and of whom this report is particularly critical. No meeting with the commissioners, no report to the City Council, no discussion at the Health Board. And the report is clear that the critical bodies in the City have failed to grasp the scale of the challenge. Key recommendations from the first report two years ago have simply not been addressed. Unsurprisingly, the rebrand of the Integrated Substance Misuse Service itself, a rebrand of a rebrand, to Dundee Drugs and Alcohol Services has done nothing to change the culture or perception of a service that is failing clients, families and my city. So the closure of Constitution House should have happened years ago, but a long last has been accepted that it should happen by the end of this year. But that cannot next steps be in this be cosmetic change. There must be wholesale change from the centralised medical model. Uh, it must be deconstructed. Relocating is not enough. The Dundee Partnership must respond fully to the work that has been done and must accept and fool the recommendations made for them, including the recommendations from the original report. Clients are, are deserve services that, where hard-pressed staff are proud to work and clients can have a confidence, be respected and invest in hope. I would say, um, the Minister, and that you, that we, we do risk, I think, in this debate, in the absence of a real strategy published and a plan that we can actually scrutinise and see whether actually our proposals meet. In the absence of that, I think that the kind of, the, the kind of tone that we are seeing in this debate today might just get worse. Thank you, Ms. Mara. I now call Colette Stevenson to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Up to six minutes, please, Ms. Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. Drug-related deaths and drug harms are a public health emergency. The number of people dying from drugs in Scotland is heartbreaking, and the ripple effect of one person having an addiction can be far-reaching. One of my first speeches after my election was on this topic. I started it by paying tribute to my brother Brian, who we lost to an overdose in 2002. Brian was at the forefront of my mind again when I was thinking about today's debate and the effect that drugs have on people. He often talked about the monkey he couldn't get off his back, no matter what. Brian lived with me for a while, but one of the biggest regrets of my life was asking him to leave because of his chaotic lifestyle. I never seen him alive again. I just wish that there had been the right support mechanisms in place for people with addictions and their families to cope. I could be telling a different story today. My dad chose the song For a Dancer by Jackson Brown for Brian's funeral, and I think the words sum up his lifestyle perfectly. And don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. I don't remember losing track of you. You were always dancing in and out of you. I must have thought you'd always be around, always keeping things real by playing the clown. Now you're nowhere to be found. Before he died, Brian was living in Hope House in Glasgow and had been off drugs for six weeks. He was doing well and all the guys there thought he was brilliant. He was then offered a job as a security guard at a festival, which he accepted. Brian and his friends ended up overdosing. Paramedics managed to revive his friend, but sadly, Brian got that monkey off his back in the worst possible way. He was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. Since then, some things have changed. In 2011, Scotland was the first country in the world to introduce a national naloxone programme empowering individuals, families, friends and communities to reverse an opiate overdose. 
Since then, the rollout has increased dramatically, from police officers and paramedics to the take-home kits given to individuals at risk of an overdose and their relatives. Had naloxone been so widely available back in 2002, Brian could be alive today. My speech today could have been one focused on my lived experience as a sister of someone who survived an overdose, managed to get that monkey off his back and was living a happy life there to see his daughter grow up and to be the amazing uncle he could have been. Like many others I have spoken to, I hope that sharing my own experience today shines a light on how we tackle this drug crisis and the importance of getting the right support in place for people who take drugs and their loved ones. I would encourage anyone watching visit StopTheDeaths.com and order naloxone. It could save a life. Of course, while a vital tool, we must accept that there are many opportunities to help someone before it, become, before it comes to administering naloxone. At the heart of the national mission to save and improve lives is to get people into the treatment and recovery that is right for them. One aspect is residential rehabilitation, which the Scottish Government recently reviewed. More can be done there, so I welcome the action taken to date to improve access to and boost the use of publicly funded residential rehabilitation. Another very welcome development is the MAT standards, which will ensure people can get the help the day they ask for it. That is so vital for addictions. Any approach in tackling drug harms must accept that a range of possible interventions are required. We need treatments available through the NHS, whether that is heroin-assisted treatment, opioid substitutes, detox or residential options. We need interventions in the community like peer support workers, and we need access to advice for housing, social security, employment and training. I recently visited the WISE group and learned a lot about their work, which also benefits people who have experience of substance misuse, from signposting to mentoring schemes to support, to support for getting back in touch with relatives. Relationships and families are a crucial part of that recovery process for many, and this kind of wraparound support is so important. More generally, I think we should be cautious in thinking there is a one-size-fits-all solution here. Residential treatment might be great for one person, but for another, taking one drug instead of many would be a success, given polydrug use is now the leading cause of drug-related deaths in Scotland. If we are serious about wanting to tackle the drug deaths emergency and drug-related harms, then we must accept this complexity. We must also realise that tackling deprivation is key to reducing the adverse impacts of drugs on individuals and communities. Tory policies in the 80s and today have driven inequality, which is associated with drug use and addictions. So to conclude, Presiding Officer, I fully appreciate that the number of people dying from drugs in Scotland is not just a number. Each and every person is a mum, dad, brother, sister, son, daughter or friend who had their own hopes and dreams. Improving treatment options and access to health care and facilitating recovery are essential. Same-day treatment will make a big difference and we need to continue the work to remove stigma and support families. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Stevenson. I now call Gillian Mackay to be followed by Paul McLennan. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As I begin this speech, my thoughts are with everyone who's lost a loved one to a drug overdose and I pay tribute to Colette Stevenson's powerful speech before mine. When we have these debates, we often focus on policy and reform, but it's important that we also take time to reflect on the lives lost and the terrible pain felt by those who have been bereaved. For too long, our criminal justice system and drug treatment services have robbed people of the dignity they deserve. Our focus must be to restore that dignity while preventing further deaths. The 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act is outdated and obsolete and further erodes the dignity and safety of people who use drugs. In its 2021 report on drug law reform, the Drug Deaths Task Force stated that it was unequivocal that the Act in its current form creates barriers to the implementation of a public health approach. 
When the case for reform was put to the Minister of State for Crime and Policing at the Joint Committee meeting, however, it was clear that he had neither a good grasp of the situation in Scotland nor the root causes of drug use. When asked if he recognised that poverty was an underlying cause of drug use which needed to be tackled, he answered no, and, he, and said that he believed drugs and violence drive poverty. I have spoken before in this chamber that the fact that Scotland's drug death crisis can be traced back to the 1980s deindustrialisation and the subsequent economic and social impact. According to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, some of those experiencing the highest levels of drug deaths and drug-related harms grew up in the post-industrial 1980s, when unemployment levels were high and the heroin market expanded into these deprived communities. This group suffer multiple complex disadvantages, including poor physical and mental health, unemployment, unstable housing arrangements, involvement with the criminal justice system and family breakdown. That the UK Government is so far behind in this conversation should worry us all. How can we hope to effectively tackle this crisis when UK Ministers are espousing such ill-informed views which further stigmatise people who use drugs? Kit Malthouse refused to entertain the prospect of drug, drug checking facilities here in Scotland. As we heard in the Chamber last week, there are now plans and a licence issued by the Home Office to operate a facility in Bristol. These services can save lives. I wish the Loop, who will operate the facility, the very best. I hope that they will have incredible success and once and for all hopefully provide the evidence that the UK Government might listen to. It is nonsensical and hypocritical to rule out drug checking services here in Scotland and allowing them in England. We need these powers to save lives. The varying purity and strength of illicit drugs makes it impossible for... Yes, Mike Mara. Uh, it's my understanding that a licence has been made so far in Scotland, but I, I, I would welcome, and greatly so, uh, drug checking services. But would the member agree with me that the, our, our, the, uh, our government, of which our party is a member, that the, these facilities must be funded, and a pilot, if it's forthcoming, must be funded appropriately with staff costs, with the appropriate equipment that's required in order to make this work? Julian Mackay. So what I was doing was reflecting on the questions that we had asked Kit Malthouse, and that was one of the questions we put, was, was the UK, would the UK government um, back drug checking facilities here in Scotland? And the answer was, was no. But I do agree that if that was, was something we could, we could bring forward, then we would be more than happy to chat to the, minister, uh, chat to the member about all the, all the measures he just mentioned. Safe consumption rooms and another life-saving intervention which must be allowed to operate in Scotland. Mr Malthouse said he needed more evidence on safe consumption rooms. Considering they have been operating in Europe for around three decades and have proved effective in a range of countries from around the world, including Australia, Canada, Spain, Switzerland and the Netherlands, I am not sure what further evidence the Minister requires. These facilities could be saving lives now. I found the Minister's focus on enforcement particularly disturbing. In Scotland, we have a general consensus that a public health approach is needed to solve this crisis. The UK Government clearly does not share this view. To them, it is a criminal justice matter, despite all of the harm and stigmatisation the war on drugs has caused. I was also disappointed by the Minister's use of stigmatising language, which I will not repeat here. We do people a disservice when we label them. It robs them of their dignity and humanity and others them. If we want treatment services built around human rights, we must dispense with such language and speak about people as if they are human beings, deserving of our respect and compassion. We need a person-centred system which views people as whole beings, not as various conditions and needs to be, that need to be categorised and dealt with separately. Above all, we must seek to reduce and prevent harm wherever possible and must maximise every opportunity to connect people with services. The more we embed stigma-free treatment and life-saving interventions in the, in the community, the greater chances of connecting with those who need the, the help the most. To take one example, I was pleased to see the rollout of naloxone to some taxi drivers in Edinburgh, which will surely result in more lives being saved. I applaud all of those in this scheme, which has also been implemented in Glasgow, and hope to see it extended to more of our cities and towns. The Scottish Greens also support the rollout of heroin assisted treatment across Scotland. According to NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, there is high quality evidence to suggest that it can improve individual and societal outcomes 
when provided as a second-line treatment for people with chronic opioid dependency. This is yet another area where meaningful progress is being blocked. Stakeholders have reported to the Drug Desk Task Force that the process for submitting a licence application for HAT is overly complicated and resource intensive, and that the ability to offer HAT alongside other medication-assisted treatment should be more widespread and that any remaining barriers to the provision be removed. Despite the fact that HAT is a well-evidenced intervention that has clear health and, so and social benefits, rollout is being hindered by an over overly bureaucratic process. I have heard the Minister for Drug Policy say on more than one occasion that we need to turn expressions of interest from health boards into commitments. At the moment, health boards must apply to the Home Office and the Scottish Government and can be approved by one but rejected by the other, which may discourage some from, from applying. It is vital that HAT licensing is devolved to Scotland to reduce the administrative burden and facilitate its Ms. rollout Mithaki, across Scotland. Your to close. Thank, you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I now call uh, Paul McLennan to be followed by Sandish Gohani. Up to six minutes, please, Mr McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, and thanks to the committee, committee conveners for their contributions and others uh, today. Uh, the fact that this is a joint debate demonstrates the impact drugs misuse has on many aspects of everyday life in Scotland, and I'm glad we're spending sufficient time to discuss this and debate this today. Although I'm now a member of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee, I wasn't at the time of the joint session with the Criminal Justice and Health and Social Care Committee, which was held on the 1st of February. However, having read the official report, a few, uh, a, a few things stand out to me. Alina Whitman, in her question to Kit Malthouse, asked about the link around about poverty, and we've heard a few members raise that today. She stated there are very strong links between poverty, deprivation, adverse childhood experiences, trauma and drug deaths, especially here in Scotland. We all know that this is a very complex and multifaceted issue to address. She asked at the time, would you agree with the opinion that Scotland's high rate of drug deaths reflects historical patterns resulting from economic policies of the 1980s, which we can also see in the north east of England? She also asked about whether anti-poverty measures taken by the Scottish Government would have an impact. UK Police Minister Kit Mall is in the report which has stated, and I quote, and this is a worrying part, I would be careful about the difference between correlation and causation. Earlier today, we have heard of the study from researchers from Glasgow University who found that austerity was the most likely reason that life expectancy had stagnated after 2012 and death rates in the poorest areas had increased. There is very clearly a link. Kit Mall has further stated over the years that there have been lots of attempts to deal with the underlying problems of poverty and deprivation, in the hope that doing so would deal with the violence and drugs that were perceived at the time to be the product of these problems. It is clear the UK Government needs to do more to tackle poverty. I still think the UK Government sees this issue far too much as a criminal rather than a predominantly health issue. Elena also stated that the cohort of people among those who are seeing the most drug deaths at the moment are people who were born in the 1970s that were seeing multiple deprivation and problematic drug use. Kit Mulhouse and his ply said the police could play an enormous role in assisting health professionals and those who can give counselling, emotional support and everything else that is required to turn someone round from drugs by ensuring that there are fewer drug dealers and less drugs in Scotland. Focus on poverty is a contributing factor in the National Drugs Mission. Alongside the clear understanding of this, predominantly as a health issue, is fundamentally important. The second aspect I want to touch on was on drugs consumption rooms. Gillian Martin, Gillian Mackay and Pauline Mackay all pressed uh, Kit Mulhouse on their issue. Uh, sorry, Pauline McNeil, my apologies. As we know, many experts, people uh, with lived experience in committees, such as the Scottish Affairs Committee at Westminster, have recommended the introduction of such rooms, given the contribution that they can make to reducing drug deaths in the UK. Gillian Mackay stated in, in, in the meeting that at least 39 sites in Canada, and there are peer-reviewed articles from Portugal, and there is an evidence base in San Francisco, Seattle, Boston, Vermont, Delaware and Portland in Oregon. Polly McNeill further stated that there are 66 sites throughout the world with consumption rooms. Moreover, 300 health professionals in England and Wales signed a letter after the Health and Social Care Committee at Westminster calling for the introduction of drug consumption rooms. The case for the UK Government changing position is strong and compelling. The Royal College of Physicians in their briefing stated safe drug consumption facilities have been operating in Europe for around about three decades. And a, and a quote, they offer opportunities to reduce the acute risks of disease, disease transmission through unhygienic injecting. Critically, they can prevent drug-related overdose deaths and connect high-risk drug users with addiction treatment and other health and social services. They further stated evidence from the European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Addiction highlights that such facilities also help to reduce both drug use in public spaces and the prevalence of discarded needles. 
They went on to say safe drug, uh, drug consumption rooms have proved effective in a range of countries such as Australia, Canada, Spain, Switzerland, Netherlands and others. The evidence indicates that such facilities do not increase drug use, nor do they increase the frequency of injecting. The College therefore would recommend that safe drug consumption facilities can, if implemented well, provide people who use drugs in Scotland with an environment to take drugs using safe equipment with expertly trained staff to support their emotional and physical health needs. If I've got time, Simon, if I can. Well, well uh, for a very brief intervention, uh, okay. a bit of time, but not yep. much will be added on. Russell Finlay. Well, thank you. I'm just wondering what the member's view is on the Chief Constable of Police Scotland, who has asked for greater evidence before we're able to support drugs consumption rooms. Paul McLennan. I, I think the evidence I presented there is quite clear and compelling, as I said before in, in the statement I just made. Uh, I, I want to touch on a few other issues that the, the, the RCP raised in their briefing on MAT standards. They are very clear that the state optimising the use of medication-assisted treatment mid, uh, can mitigate opioid use disorder. We have heard that already. The new standard of MAT will ensure the necessary range of support is available wherever people live in Scotland to reduce harm and promote recovery. The, the, the task force has identified that it is a priority to get more people onto MAT in a timely manner and to support them in the treatment as long as they need. The College supports the MAT standards. Continued focus on this area is key. The second issue is that of rehabilitation beds. People in services have better protection from drug, drug deaths. That is a fact. £100 million for £250 million pounds additional investment will support further investment and expansion of residential rehabilitation and assisted aftercare. We need to develop sustainable capacity in regional centres across the country, and this work will be inclusive of different models of care. Different funding models can play a significant role in determining the availability of rehabilitation services locally and across the country. Getting people into treatment and recovery at the right frame at the right time is the core of our national mission. Presenting officer, in conclusion, this debate has been a good debate looking at what we all know is a complex issue. There is much agreement. There are still areas where we disagree. The tone at times has not been helpful. Progress has been made. Let us make sure we work together moving forward to continue progress and support individuals, families and communities in Scotland that we were elected to serve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McLennan. I now call Sanders Gohani to be followed by Katie Clark. Up to six minutes, please, Dr Gohani. Patricia knows only too well how Scotland's SNP government is failing families who have loved ones struggling with addiction. Patricia's son is 47. He has a drug addiction and has been on methadone for years. And he wants to be free. He describes methadone as like liquid handcuffs. It's as if he's shackled to the chemist and fears he'll remain so for the rest of his days. That's because support for recovery and rehabilitation is thin on the ground. Of course, for recovery to work, those with addictions must want to change. But to do so, to take responsibility for their own recovery, they need long-term support and supervision from professionals who believe in them. Recovery is a long, bumpy and winding road. People with addictions trying so hard to get their lives back on track often suffer daily with headaches, nervous symptom disorders and disorientation. It's really important that we have their backs and we're there for them in the long run. Patricia explains that this is simply not happening. Furthermore, from her experience, there is far too much red tape for access servicing in the first place. Then, when mistakes occur, like a service failing to communicate an appointment, guess who gets the blame for the did not attend? Dentistry is an important part of the recovery process, and not only for repairing extensive tooth decay and gum disease. Poor dental health is a stigma associated with drug addiction. It influences how people see addicts and also how addicts see themselves. So dental interventions can change the self-image for the better, and this is so important for well-being and recovery. Patricia wrote to me again on Friday. She is pleading for access to a safe and well-supported rehabilitation unit, a caring service that will help her son off his dependency on methadone, so he can have, as she says, a life worth living. Now, this is a six-foot man who weighs just nine stone, and today he's crying out for just one right in life, a right to recovery. Deputy Presiding Officer, we're not seeing anywhere near enough progress to advance the rehabilitation and treatment of addiction in Scotland. Addiction is ruining countless lives. Families are being torn apart, and over the past decade, thousands have died directly from drug-related deaths. Over 1,300 people died 
in 2020 alone. There were five times as many drug-related deaths in 2020 as in 2000. Scotland's drug rate is three and a half times that of the UK as a whole. This is a scandal. This is Scotland's national shame. No, this is our Parliament's shame. This is a failure of government. Across the chamber, I believe we agree that the current strategies don't work. The Scottish Conservatives support a public health approach to substance use. We need to have a right to treatment and ongoing support to turn lives around. We need to care and encourage people right through their recovery journey. This is why we feel so strongly about our right to addiction recovery bill. The key underlying principle is to ensure that everyone who seeks treatment for drugs or alcohol addiction is able to access the necessary addiction treatment they require. This would be a clear binding commitment to families, to communities across the country. A promise. It's unambiguous. It's enshrined in law. The consultation on our proposal showed an overwhelmingly positive response, with 77% of, of people supportive of the proposals, and this included organisations with hard experience of working with sufferers from addiction, including Fears and Voices of Recovery, Cisco, the Scottish Tenants Association, Recovery Enterprises of Scotland, and the Church of Scotland. I'm also pleased that the Minister for Drugs Policy has signalled a move towards Scottish Government support for our proposals, and I hope we can speedily work together across Parliament to ensure a right to recovery is put into law as soon as possible. Of course, details are as important, but so is delivery. In order to deliver the Right to Recovery Bill, there is an obligation on NHS health boards, Scottish ministers and others to provide treatment and set up reporting arrangements so that the quality and access of treatment provided can be monitored and reported, and reported to the Scottish Parliament. Because Parliament needs to see the data. If we don't measure it, we can't improve it. The addiction and recovery treatment services would include community-based short and long-term residential rehab, community-based and residential detox, stabilisation services, substitute prescribing services. Individuals may access a preferred treatment option unless it's deemed harmful by a medical professional. Our Right to Recovery Bill also prevents individuals from being refused access to treatment, including for reasons like having a criminal history involving substance abuse, mental health assessment, being in receipt of, sub of, of substitute prescribing services or individuals that are still using alcohol and drugs. If you want support, you get it. Deputy Presiding Officer, I believe all of us in this chamber are horrified by the rising death tolls of addiction-related deaths and how addiction has spiralled out of control, tearing families apart and blighting communities. This is a huge problem for Scotland and it's complex. Tackling this head-on requires coordinated action to include support recovery reducing demand and restricting supply. It's worth noting that coordinating with the four nations on tackling drug, drug dealing and organised crime is important. In February, for example, we heard the police in Kent raided a manufacturing facility and seized 27 million street benzodiazepine tablets that were bound for Glasgow. Just as we don't want Scotland to be seen as a safe place for criminals to do business, we need to work with partners across the UK to damage the source of their supplies. But the thrust of my speech today is supporting people who want to kick their addiction. We should be striving to ensure that no one falls through the gaps and there is no stigma attached to addiction. We need to commit to long-term support. Dr Gahani, could you please bring your remarks to a close? With, Thank you. With those local areas with the highest need receiving the most support. And our right to a recovery bill is the way forward. And I refer members to my register of interest as a practising NHS GP. I now call uh, Casey Clark to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate. And as a member of the Criminal Justice Committee, the commitment to a public health approach, as it is clear that a criminal justice-led approach has not worked. It has not prevented the rise of problematic drug use or turned around the lives of those with drug abuse problems. I think we all know that drug abuse is a major problem in many of our communities. It's a major problem for our criminal justice system and has become a massive problem in our prisons, where drugs are readily available and many prisoners take drugs for the first time. Of course, many offences are committed 
whilst the individual is under the influence of drugs and are associated with serious drug abuse. There were, three, sorry, there were 1,339 drug-related deaths in 2020. And as has been said by a number of members, there is no doubt there is a direct link to poverty, trauma and deprivation. It also has to be said that Scotland has a problem with high-risk patterns of drug use, and we need to look at how that compares with elsewhere. We know that drug-related deaths have been increasing since 1996 and have increased substantially over the last 20 years, but also the average age of drug-related deaths has increased from 32 years to 43 years over the last 20 years. And people in the most deprived areas are 18 times more likely to have a drug-related drug death than in the least deprived areas. In the 2020s, that was only 10 times as likely. We also know that 93% of deaths um, occur where there is more than one dr drug present in the body. And I think all of these factors are aspects that we need to be aware of when we look at how we tackle this problem. Because over 10,000 people have lost their lives to drugs since 2007. And we know that that crisis is complex and that we need bold action to reduce drug-related harms. So we need a holistic approach grounded in public health. We also, however, need to recognise that there is a real problem with those living with addiction being exploited by criminal gangs and that the nature of the drugs trade itself has links with organised crime. The cuts to council services and the cuts to alcohol and drugs services, which Claire Baker spoke about in her speech, and indeed the wider underfunding of public services more generally, clearly is an important factor with the rising levels of inequality and the growing gap between rich and poor in our society. Last year, the Scottish Ambulance Service attended 2,500 incidents where street benzos were involved and over 1,000 were overdose incidents. As has been said, I believe, earlier by the Minister, we know that the problems are becoming greater for women in particular, and that is an aspect that we need to look at very, very seriously. We know there are no silver bullets, but there is strong evidence that drug um, consumption rooms, safer drug consumption facilities um, are effective. It's not a new idea. It's an idea that's been around for many decades, but there's been disagreement over many years as to whether it is a practice that is compliant with the misuse of drugs legislation. The Criminal Justice Committee heard evidence from the Lord Advocate um, earlier this session that she believed um, that it might be possible um, for there to be a legal route or indeed a route um, that um, there could be um, a public interest um, ground for providing drug consumption rooms in the public sector. She indicated that she would consider a new proposal on public interest grounds, providing it was precise, detailed and specific underpinned by evidence and supported by those who were responsible for policing such a facility. The Scottish Affairs Select Committee highlighted in their evidence um, work by the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs um, that, that said that there was no overdose deaths um, that had occurred in such facilities as at 2016. I hope um, that the Scottish Government is working to look at what can be done to address the specific issues that were raised by the Lord Advocate, that have been raised by drugs consumption rooms, and indeed are being brought forward in Paul Sweeney's bill, um, to ensure that we can go forward to look at this specific issue to provide a legal framework in the public sector for such drug consumption rooms. It's only one small part of what is a complex and challenging issue for government and for all of us, but I hope that it's one aspect that we can see movement on from the Scottish Government quickly.
Thank you. Uh, Ms Clark, I now call on Stuart McMillan, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Up to six minutes, please, Mr McMillan. Thank you very much, Mr Singer. So first of all, I would like to remind the Chamber that I am a board member of the Addiction Recovery Service moving on Inverclyde. Mr Singer, also, this joint debate by three committees of this Parliament provides an example of the type of joined up working that is required, and I agree with the comments from Elena Witham earlier when she stated that every committee in this Parliament has a role to play. This debate is of particular importance to me due to the sobering figures I read when the drugs death figures are published each year. Inverclyde, per head of population, is normally one of the areas with the highest number of drugs related to deaths. 33 constituents died in 2020, 28 men and 5 women. And of these people who died, 63 per cent of those who died were in the 35 to 54 age category. That is my age group. Last night, I was reminded of how my age group it can be caught up in drugs misuse. After a meeting I attended, I was informed of a, a school friend who sadly has been involved with heroin for some time. Growing up in Port Glasgow with declining traditional employment opportunities, it will certainly be part of the reason as to why some people became involved in drugs. And it's something that I've spoken about in this chamber before. And this is where the issue of deprivation, touched upon earlier by speakers and also by Michael Mara's intervention earlier, is relevant. The report published by Glasgow University and the Glasgow Centre for Population Health today has suggested people are dying younger as a result of UK government austerity certainly will not help the situation we as a society face. With regards to drug-related deaths, the report states, and I quote, there is evidence of the effects of UK government austerity measures. Their impact is seen as twofold, reducing levels of important services such as addictions, housing, mental health, welfare rights and so on, and cutting individual incomes by reductions in social security payments, leading to further drug use as a coping mechanism. There are many areas of society that uh, we all can and must do more to improve, but we can't do anything when someone has passed. They leave behind parents, children, friends who have to live with that loss forever. We must and can do more, and that's why when the First Minister uh, announced um, in January 21 the national mission to reduce drugs-related deaths and harms, uh, supported by the £250 million funding over this parliamentary session. Uh, I welcomed that. I welcomed the, that funding uh, to go towards improving and increasing services for people affected by drug addiction. The aim of the national mission is to save and improve lives uh, through, first of all, fast and appropriate access to treatment uh, and support through all services, and improve frontline drug services, including the third sector. And that is something I have touched upon and others have touched upon in the Chamber uh, before. Uh, across the, uh, last week, uh, I met with uh, the head of the Inverclyde Alcohol and Drugs Recovery Service. The local ADRS has, a, has had a change of strategy in recent years by bringing together the alcohol team and also the drugs team. Previously, they had operated independently. Uh, in a paper to the Inverclyde Integrated Joint Board in March 2020, the following was highlighted, and I quote, the review of alcohol and drugs service provision within Inverclyde is nearing completion, with an aim to develop a cohesive and fully integrated whole system approach for service users affected by alcohol and drug issues. Inverclyde historically has not had a well-developed recovery community. Therefore, developing more robust recovery opportunities has been identified as an area of required focus and attention. Work has commenced with a recovery strategy being developed. Now, I welcome the changes that have happened locally, and I know that uh, there is a more cohesive and partnership approach taking place that just really has not happened before. Across the Chamber, everyone will agree that we need to listen more to the needs and experiences of those who have lived with an addiction and also their family and friends. And too often, those with an addiction also suffer from mental health issues, which would cause issues with housing, finances, and put pressures on family dynamics. Now, this can then lead to a person's life being difficult to manage and to fall away from treatment services. And the Scottish Government highlighted a need to address the, uh, the, the high did not attend rates. As we know, a high proportion of people who died from drug related causes never had contact with a drug treatment service. And to help this aim, the Scottish Government is providing £3 million per year to local services through alcohol and drug partnerships to increase outreach to people who need that support. The Scottish Government is also increasing the capacity of statutory to fund residential rehabilitation places by 300 per cent by the end of 2026, when at least 1,000 people will be publicly funded for replacement. 
Uh, presenting officer, safe uh, drug consumption rooms uh, and naloxone have been spoken about already. And the naloxone rollout programme is something that I welcome and, uh, and I bought into it at the very outset. The establishment of safe drug consumption rooms, consumption rooms sorry, on the other hand, it took me longer to accept. Uh, the marketing campaign to raise awareness of naloxone and the signs of overdose, I'm sure, will prove to be very beneficial in the long term. Uh, but on the issue of the safe uh, dr drug consumption rooms, uh, it took me a lot longer, as I said. Uh, but uh, the fact is, they work. They save lives. And if, across this chamber, if we actually do want to save lives, every, every single thing has got to be on the table for consideration. Uh, I want to uh, say thank you to uh, the Minister and the Scottish Government for the £400,000 uh, investment uh, to the Jericho Society in my constituency. Jericho Society runs two residential units in Greenock, one for men and also one for women. Um, and, uh, Jericho has also received £78,000 last year from the Scottish Government, which allowed them to increase staffing hours by 50 hours uh, in the Women's House. Uh, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, and that's why I genuinely believe that having, that, having a, a debate, having actions across this Parliament, uh, across society, is the only way that we can really make, the, make those achievements and save those lives that we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McMillan. We will now move to closing speeches, and I call on Pauline McNeill. Up to six minutes, please, Ms McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll begin by saying I think it is important that the Scottish Government as a whole acknowledge that they have failed to tackle Scotland's outrageous and tragic level of high drug death. So we can assess our approach to the scandalous state of affairs with dire human consequences, as outlined in, I think, in a really uh, important and good contribution from Stuart Millen there. But as Michael Mara said earlier, and others have said, we still have no answers as to why Scotland in particular has such acute figures, the worst in Europe. Claire Baker said it in her contribution. And also that we are not alone. But I think it is important to keep on trying to get an answer to this question. Otherwise, we will not be sure that we are heading in the right direction. The Government is already slow to meet its own commitments, as Claire Baker also said, around the MAT standards. Therefore, it is all the more important that the Opposition work with the Government, as we have all committed to, but also push the Government to deliver on what they have promised, especially on treatment programmes and the MAT standards. Now, I do not envy the job of Angela Constance, the Minister, and I want to put on the record that she has my full support in her endeavours. I must interrogate the commitment that she has made, I welcome it, uh, to increase drug and treatment facilities by 300 per cent by the end of the Parliament. But it will be meaningless unless this report can tell us what this looks like in a year, in two years and the year after. So we need to see what progress we are going to make in the years between. Uh, some very excellent contributions uh, this afternoon. I think it was Gillian Martin who was first to point out the link between drug deaths and deprivation. Many other speakers have said that. And uh, it was even more worrying that the cost of living crisis, the worst in living memory, unfortunately, is likely to create more deprivation and will unfortunately make the government's job even harder. While drug misuse is now recognised as primarily a public health issue, well, I hope that is what we have come to. Uh, rather than a criminal justice issue, as Katie Clark spoke to in her contribution, uh, we need to go a lot further to reduce the stigma of addiction, as outlined by Emma Harper. Fundamentally, drug addicts are people in pain, both mental and physical pain. There is usually some sort of recent or past tragedy that has developed into trauma where drugs have been used to numb some of those difficulties that manifest in daily life. And may I pay tribute to the courage of Colette Stevenson, who has come to this chamber to talk about her family experience and her brother. I think that must have been hard. I commend her for doing so. Darren McGarvey, who is serious on Scotland's problems with addictions, recently aired on BBC, said alcoholics and drug addicts it need our love. And I believe that to be true. But if the government wants our constructive support, then it does also need to focus on what we can do now. We have two separate proposals, one from Douglas Ross, one from Paul Sweeney, and they do exist because of the vacuum that there has been on government policy on preventing uh, drug, drug deaths. Now, both, I think, are worthy of consideration. I want to say something about that later on. 
As we've heard, in Scotland there were nearly five times as many deaths in 2020 compared with the year 2000. And we should probably reflect on how outrageous that statistic is. And that's why we ask those with power and those with the influence, such as a Lord Advocate, to consider what can be done within the law to change this. Portugal is often highlighted as a success story. Drug rates were similar to the EU average. And in 2001, Portugal changed their policy towards a health-led approach, and drug-related deaths there have remained below the EU average and since 2001. So there's no reason why Scotland cannot turn things around on a similar way, in a similar way. But we need to ask the question, are we really on track for that? As Claire Baker also said in her opening contribution, we can't allow the government to backtrack on the swift implementation of medically assisted treatment standards until they are implemented, because lives will unnecessarily be lost. I want to talk a little bit about drug consumption rooms and uh, Naloxone, so which other members have. I just want to read this out from one of the briefings. As we have all talked about on many occasions, the well-known Peter Kaikan ran a drug consumption facility in a minibus for over a year. Uh, over 10 months, the facility supervised over 800 uh, injections. And at this point, David Liddell of the Scottish Drugs Forum has said there was no public interest in prosecuting him for the drug consumption rooms that he ran and no prosecution followed. But it seems the ridiculous state of affairs that he can run a service, not be prosecuted, but NHS in Greater Glasgow cannot run the one that it wants to. So what I would say to ministers, and I don't think there's a lot of disagreement on this, I think we need to sort out this public policy. What seems to be a bit of a mess around this, uh, and we need to do it very soon because, as I've argued many times in this chamber, uh, drug consumption rooms are one small part, but it's a gateway to treatment. And I think it's a really important point to make. Um, it's a gateway to those seeking the treatment at which the minister has made a commitment to expanding. Um, they exist in other countries such as Australia, Canada, Switzerland and the Netherlands. So it's a clearly a, a radical step to take. But importantly, there have been no deaths where consumption rooms have been used. And I think it's a really important, important point to acknowledge. And this is also acknowledged by the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh, who recommend safe drug consumption facilities as well as rolling out the heroin-assisted treatment programmes in all major centres um, in Scotland. And they say that it's safe, drug, uh, safe drug consumption facilities can prevent drug-related overdoses. Uh, so it's only one way, but I think it's important to sort that out. In conclusion, presiding officer, um, I wanted to uh, conclude by saying I do wait with real interest to the report in June that the minister referred to. I hope there are going to be signs in that report that we're on the right track. But I would ask, if we're not on the right track, I think it's important that ministers come to the chamber humbly and tell us that we're not on the right track. Because if we're all serious about this, then the approach that we will take is to acknowledge that and then put our heads together, work together to change that. Because if we don't, there are far too many lives at stake. Thank you, Ms McNeill. I now call on Jamie Green. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Green. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by echoing the sombre comments made by others in the Chamber uh, and pass our condolences to anyone watching this or who have been affected by not just drug-related deaths, but the very presence of drugs in their lives, their own or their families. And I commend Colette Stevenson for sharing a very deeply personal and moving experience of uh, what that means. Uh, I think too often uh, we forget that we are in a position of great privilege to be able to use our platforms in public life to share our own uh, personal experiences and I know that's not easy to do as someone who's tried to do it myself. I actually would prefer that future debates about the subject uh, lend themselves more in tone and content to talking about some of the progress that we're making, not the year on year rise in drug deaths that have so often become the reality of debates such as this. And I share Mr Maher's concern that I, having listened carefully to today's debate, I fear that the tone of collegiate and constructive consensus which did exist in the early days of this topic have been replaced by a merry-go-round of blame game, uh, political or otherwise. And I, I do find that deeply unfortunate because the statistics are grim. The statistics bear uh, themselves true. We are the drug death capital of Europe. And the point being made by many repeatedly today 
and a point that I tried to make earlier is that the rate of drug deaths in Scotland is much higher than that of the rest of UK, the UK, where there exists a very similar legislative environment which deals with how drugs are dealt with, and arguably it's more relaxed in Scotland than other parts of the UK, but equally where there are huge pockets of deprivation right across England, especially in the Midlands and the North, uh, where there are major drug problems, and that is widely accepted by the government south of the border, but their drug death rate is markedly lower, and that's something that's never been properly academically identified, discussed in a way where we can have that conversation without it's your fault, it's her fault, it's their fault, it's that minister's fault, it's not my minister's fault. And I think we could have that conversation, and we should have that conversation. I'm happy to give way. Eleanor Wisdom. I thank the member for taking the intervention. I wonder if um, you would agree with myself, you know, back in the mid-2000s when I did um, a lot of work with people experiencing drug use, um, I would traipse around lots of different GP practices trying to get prescriptions for um, benzodiazepines for these people, but general practice had wholesale stopped prescribing due to the fact that things were being sold on in the open market. And that, I think, is one of the, the key areas where we perhaps saw a shift and a change in the way that um, Scotland was dealing with drugs and drugs deaths. Jamie Green? It's one of many factors, actually. I don't disagree with that. You know, the, 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 the supply of cheap street drugs is a major problem. I mean, you don't need to go far from this building to speak to people uh, about how cheaply and easily it is to source uh, illicit factory-made uh, pills uh, which replace those that previously hitherto were prescribed to people. Now, we are not clinicians, some of us are, but these are complex uh, discussions which have to take place. I appreciate that there are a wide range of factors. Many have been mentioned. You know, people were talking about the 1980s and social deprivation in areas like where I grew up. And I, and I accept that they have been fundamental root causes going back a generation, but that was 40 years ago. That was 40, 45 years ago. What I'm saying now is that we have a, a powerfully devolved parliament, a powerfully devolved government, who could have made different choices in the last decade and didn't. Um, we cannot talk about the use of drugs if we don't address the issue of supply. And I think that's an important part of this debate, which has been missing. Drugs do not magic themselves onto the streets of Scotland. They are put there for a complex network of supply, of production, and distribution, and that starts right at the very top from the dealer network. There are pill-making factories right now in Scotland making little blue pills that people are selling for 50p a pop, which are, people are overdosing, they're mixing with other drugs, and that is a, a fundamental part of the reason why so many are suffering fatal outcomes. We know, of course, there are cross-border issues, complex cross-border issues, county lines, trafficking, uh, slavery, money laundering, what Scotland really needs, actually, is both of its governments working together on solutions to these intra- and international crime issues. And I don't think that is helped by the tone of the debate that I've heard thus far today. Um, I could talk about diversion prosecution. I could talk about safe consumption rooms and their legality or otherwise. I think our, our, our bench's views on some of that is, is quite well rehearsed and I don't think need to be uh, played out. But there is one fundamental point that we did hear today, which is a game changer, and that's the spending review that was announced by the Finance Secretary in the moments before this debate started. I'm afraid to say that justice and the justice portfolio comes out badly in all of this. And that includes our prisons and our rehabilitation services and the community justice services that will help get people back on the straight and narrow, and the courts and the police core funding all getting a real terms cut over the next five years. We can have an argument about why and how that's happened, but we must be honest for ourselves, with ourselves and ask ministers if such cuts to frontline services will deliver the outcomes that she wants. And I will ask if that £50 million per year in the term of this parliament will be ring-fenced and will not suffer the same cut to budgets as other portfolios have had and have been announced. Um, I just want to finish by pleading with the government and, and I think rather than, than reflect on what I thought has been quite a misfortunate tone that used uh, in today's debate in taking issues with other governments and powers that we do not sit with us, what I would say is that all the frontline services that people who desperately need, need access to, they will not exist and they will not function properly if they're not properly funded and properly resourced. And I would say simply that before lamenting powers, 
uh, that ministers claim they need to fix this problem. They must be able to demonstrate to this Parliament and to the wider public they are willing to and able to use the ones they already have and use them to their fullest, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr Green. I now call on Angela Constance, Minister. Up to seven minutes, please. Okay, thank you very much, President Officer. Um, let me start by uh, genuinely thanking all speakers this afternoon, but in particular uh, Colette Stevenson for her uh, very personal contribution, because I think she was a, a great leveller uh, to all of us uh, on a cross-party basis, um, that at times we just need to uh, buckle down and focus on what matters most. And it's saving lives that is what matters most. So I thank uh, Colette for her contribution. I think most contributors this afternoon have also recognised that we can only make the necessary impact by tackling the issue of problem substance use wherever it presents, be that in our communities uh, or in our institutions or in our health and social care system. And we must ensure that all of our services from primary care through to housing, justice, etc., are all pulling in the right direction. And that's why the national mission is important, both in terms of tone, but also actions, because this is about how we as a country eh, move forward together, despite our differences, how we move forward together to address the issue eh, of problem drug use. Um, and that is essentially, eh, by and large, by taking a public health approach eh, that not only saves lives, but crucially looks at improving eh, life chances. And I um, don't shy away from the fact that uh, my first priority in coming into this post uh, was to get investment out the door into the front line. Um, and I am proud of the fact that the National Mission has secured a 67% increase in resources um, available. Um, and I think I, I would hope members would uh, welcome and recognise that there are 97 uh, front line organisations and third sector organisations who are now being directly funded uh, by government via uh, the CORA funds. Uh, and, of course, not that long ago, we announced that there are 77 projects who will benefit from £25 million over the next five years, and that came from the Children and, and Families Fund. And also, um, last week, um, I laid out in a, a statement, which I appreciate some members were under, underwhelmed by, um, and I know I can bore for Britain, if you coin the phrase, when it comes to good governance. But accountability, governance and regular reporting at a local as well as a national level is crucial. Um, and that's why in that statement I laid out about uh, the work we'll do around local outcomes frameworks, uh, about the National Mission Annual Report um, and, of course, the, the formulation of a plan that we're already proceeding with, which is in and around prevention, that emergency response, uh, treatment and recovery but also improving lives. And we are, I can assure you, gathering and publishing uh, more information than ever before in the interest of transparency and accountability. And I have consistently said that in terms of the, the right to treatment pro proposition um, from the Conservatives, that I'll give that a fair wind. I have no reason to do otherwise. And similarly with Mr Sweeney's uh, proposition, um, around uh, safer drug uh, consumption rooms, uh, likewise also. But I think Katie Clark uh, made some important points because what she did is she took us right back to the, the, the commentary made by the Lord Advocate to the Justice Committee uh, at the end of last year, where the Lord Advocate spoke about, and I am paraphrasing, uh, the limits placed on us by uh, the law ac across the UK. But she also made that question about what is in the public interest in terms of prosecution. And I want to uh, reassure uh, Katie Clark and, and Pauline McNeill, uh, because it is a matter of public record uh, that I've made repeatedly, that we are in um, uh, the, the, the guts of work that is delicate, it's detailed, but it's around meeting that need to be uh, precise and detailed and specific in our proposition. Because the reality is the evidence around safe drug consumption facilities uh, is, is compelling. And it is that gateway uh, to, to, to other, other treatments. And I suppose with the, the, the greatest respect um, to uh, any individual coming forward with, with, with a proposition, I've never ruled out uh, the need to legislate further. It's why we are uh, moving forward with a national care service uh, and a human rights bill. 
But I know, and I'm sure other members know, that statements of high principles and propositions around future legislation do not necessarily equate uh, to immediate action and acting now. And that's why you know, our focus uh, has been on scaling up the practical and financial support uh, to uh, implement, embed, uh, sustain and improve MAT standards. And that um, uh, financial support uh, went from £6 million to £10 million per annum. And of course, we will return to this issue, uh, President Officer, in just a few weeks, uh, where, and again, in the interest of transparency and accountability, uh, there will be a report that will have 145 indicators um, across uh, 29 uh, localities. In terms of our work around uh, residential rehabilitation, we have made substantial announcements. I'm not going to repeat them all here today, but this is also part of our commitment to women and families um, and keeping, keeping the promise. And members will also recall the work we've done in and around a treatment target, because at the very core of the national mission, we have to get more of our people into the treatment and recovery that is right for them. And I have always said that that is on us. The fact that we don't have enough people in treatment and recovery, I have always said, that is on us. Jamie Green. Um, I, I mean, it remains a fact that it is a point of disgrace that your ability to get residential rehabilitation is on your ability to pay at the moment, Scotland. I mean, that is, it remains an unfortunate fact. Now, these beds aren't going to magic themselves overnight. What can the government do in the more short to medium term to improve access to much-needed rehabilitation for those who need it most? Minister. Well, actually, um, if, uh, I appreciate that Mr Green follows probably justice matters more carefully uh, than issues in and around my portfolio, but the decisions uh, that I have made um, will actually result in 85 additional beds and will increase capacity by, by 20%. Um, and of course, um, the reason we're doing all this monitoring and reporting is to follow the money, because we are investing more than ever before, specifically in a residential rehab, and I am following that money uh, very, very closely, hence uh, my statement uh, to Parliament uh, last week. I want to quickly cover the issue um, of uh, benzodiazepines. Uh, the government brought together the, the expert uh, group together, uh, Mr Mara's right, February uh, this year. And one of the recommendations from that group was uh, monitoring the development of the, the pilot benzo clinic that has uh, been set up in Fife and that is funded by £274,000 per year, um, again uh, through the National Mission. And if I can say uh, to Emma Harper, the expert group also thought it was too early to move to uh, flu flu Flumazenil, uh, as it is associated with Caesars, but if she wishes uh, more detail on that, uh, she should not um, uh, hesitate to, to come and uh, speak to me. And my very final point, uh, President Officer, um, is uh, quite simply about drug law reform. I have never demurred from the importance of investment and reform of services um, and utilising uh, every aspect uh, of the powers and resources that we do have um, at our disposal. It is important, though, that we do not seek to take the easy road uh, and that we must pursue what works. And I have only ever engaged with the UK government actually on the evidence. And we do need that better conversation debate, not just between ourselves, uh, but with communities of interest in place about what will actually improve the safety and well-being of individuals and communities. And yes, that is about interruption. Minister, could I ask you to bring uh, your mics to close, please? But we must, as a matter of priority, reduce, reduce demand and improve access to treatment. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Paul O'Kane to wind up on behalf of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee. Up to eight minutes, please, Mr O'Kane. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I am pleased to have the opportunity to close this important debate on behalf of the three committees, Health, Social Care and Sport, Criminal Justice and the Social Justice and Social Security Committee, which have, uh, as we have heard, undertaken joint scrutiny work on the issue of tackling drug deaths and drug harm. And can I begin, as colleagues have, uh, on behalf of the committees, in offering our condolences to anyone who has lost a loved one to drugs. And can I thank everyone in the Chamber who has contributed to this afternoon's debate uh, from all sides of the Chamber, uh, bringing their own experience and ideas, but particularly our committee conveners who opened the Minister and party front benches, and I think also to echo uh, everyone's uh, co uh, compliments to uh, Colette Stevenson for her very powerful and personal speech. 
Uh, the debate today and the joint work uh, that has preceded it uh, is, has been important. And Excuse I... me, Mr King, could you resume your seat for a second? Could I just say there's a wee bit too much noise in the chamber and I think we all want to hear, to, uh, hear Mr Kane winding up for the committee. Thank you. Mr Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the debate and the joint work that has preceded it has been important and broadly positive, and I think a strong example of cross-committee collaboration in this Parliament. In terms of tackling drug deaths and drug harm, I think it also reflects the cross-sectoral nature of the significant challenges that we face and the variety of actions that are needed to address them. And I believe we have heard uh, some of the ideas and thinking around these issues today. We have heard from colleagues um, about the challenges that exist in rehab services. We heard that from Russell Finlay and Sue Webber. We have heard about the limitations of the Misuse of Drugs Act that was outlined by Gillian Mackay. We have heard about the need for long-term support in everyday life, as outlined by Stuart Macmillan and his contribution. The evidence we took as a joint committee from the UK Minister for Crime and Policing, Kit Malthouse, and from Angela Constance as the Scottish Government Minister with responsibility for drugs policy um, showed, I think, the, uh, that the responses and the interventions required are many and complex and will be found at multiple different levels of government. From a health, social care and sports committee perspective, today's debate has been particularly useful in shining a light on the public health aspects of drug policy, a number of which the committee will undoubtedly want to explore further as part of its future work programme. Issues like stigma um, that were raised by Emma Harper and safe drug consumption facilities raised by many colleagues today across the chamber. No doubt there will be other aspects that other colleagues uh, in the Criminal Justice and the Social Justice and Social Security Committees will want to take forward also. And hopefully we can continue to collaborate effectively across committees as we progress with important scrutiny work. Because it is clear that scrutiny uh, and ensuring government delivery will be uh, important, particularly on issues like the MAT standards, and I think ensuring that we scrutinise those two members' bills uh, in the name of Douglas Ross and Paul Sweeney that we have heard mentioned today. Uh, there were contributions today uh, about the tone of the debate. Gillian Martin spoke about uh, ensuring our tone is respectful, Michael Mara and Jamie Green uh, similarly. And I think there is something we must focus on in ensuring that we continue to find our common ground on this issue. Because there is common uh, cause across the Chamber that this is a national emergency that warrants uh, an urgent and concerted response. Uh, and I think what we've seen demonstrated today is that there is less of a consensus, perhaps, on what the solutions might be and how we move forward. Um, I had, uh, in the Joint Committee, had an exchange with Kit Malthouse where I asked if he acknowledged poverty as the underlying cause of the current drug death crisis. And he responded by saying, no, I do not. I think it's the other way round, and that, that, that violence actually uh, drives poverty rather than the other way round. But there are, con there are contrary views to that. Um, some of the written evidence that we received in committee uh, from alcohol and drug partnerships across Scotland specifically highlighted poverty and deprivation as an important contributing factor to drug harms. And that evidence pointed to a significant overlap between our most deprived communities uh, and an increased prevalence of drug harm and deaths. But it is also clear that we must drill down further to understand the particular challenges in our Scottish context and why our drug deaths are higher than other parts of the UK. I think that there, is, uh, there continues to be broad agreement within this Parliament that Scotland's drug death crisis is first and foremost a public health crisis and that our policy resp response needs to treat it as such. But of course, we must acknowledge the relationships between health and justice, uh, and one that has all too often jarred over many years. Ultimately, if we are going to find impactful solutions, presiding officer, we need to follow evidence. And it's important that we do that without prejudice or preconception. This afternoon, we have heard multiple examples of collaborative work throughout Scotland and the impact that, that is having in tackling drug harms and indeed um, the further uh, measurable impacts it could offer uh, for workable solutions that will reduce drug deaths. In winding up this debate, I would like to highlight one more example. Um, in its written submission to our call for evidence, East Renfrewshire Alcohol and Drug Partnership told us about Turning Point, 
Scotland's uh, successful funding bid to deliver the WAND initiative in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, including East Renfrewshire. That initiative delivers four key harm reduction interventions on an outreach basis. Uh, wound assessment, the assessment of injecting risk, provision of naloxone and dry blood, blood spot testing for blood-borne viruses. And I think we have heard a lot about many of those interventions uh, across the country uh, today. But the WAND initiative is one of many innovative approaches um, that the committee has heard about and written evidence. And I think it is an example of efforts to deliver consistent harm redu reduction in interventions in communities across uh, the west of Scotland. We, as legislators, um, have a responsibility to evaluate and to learn from the approaches and try to replicate what, work, what, what works. And that is why I think it has been so important today in this debate that we have heard a real strong call for evidence-based decision-making, for reporting to this parliament and for continued scrutiny and analysis of what is being done uh, in this national mission. Uh, we have also heard um, in written evidence, uh, and I think in all of our discussions on this subject, that um, an important element of an effective policy response is early intervention. We need to be mindful that an early intervention approach takes time to embed and to start delivering results, but it is no less important for that. I also want, on behalf of the committees, to note the continued willingness of the Minister to engage with our committees uh, and to be subject to the ongoing scrutiny in those committees and in this Parliament, not only in terms of the work of the Drugs Death Task Force and its implementation, but also with respect to the new National Collaborative. And we as a committee very much do look forward to continued engagement and scrutiny of the decisions the Minister takes. Across this Parliament, we all share a common goal, I believe, which is to achieve a sustainable long-term reduction in drugs deaths and harms in Scotland, and ultimately to eliminate the blight drugs uh, currently inflict on so many lives. Um, over the coming months, Presiding Officer, I hope that we can continue to do this in a collective dialogue, maintaining a laser focus on scrutinising progress. Because it is through effective collaboration across committees and across parties, and by taking an evidence-based approach, that we will have the best chance of delivering on the national mission to reduce and ultimately eradicate drugs deaths and drugs harm in Scotland. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. That concludes the debate on tackling drug deaths and drug harm. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 4723 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out changes to tomorrow's business. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak on the motion, and the question, therefore, is that motion 4723 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 4728 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on variation of standing orders. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. I move, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 4728 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. And there are no decisions to be taken as a result of today's business. We will now move on to members' business, and I ask members who are leaving the chamber to do so quietly.